Welcome back from lunch, everyone. And for those of you who uh, were not able to attend this morning and have just arrived, welcome to the Portland Art Museum and to our continuation of Minor White's Beginnings, a public symposium. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Todd Cronin. Todd is Associate Professor of Art History at Emory University. And he's the author of Against Effective Formalism, Matisse Bergson Modernism from 2013, and articles on photographic pre-visualization, chance photography, orthodoxy, Brecht, Rodchenko, Max Ernst, Minor White, R.M. Schindler, Richard Neutra, the Eameses, this is a long list, um, Merleau-Ponty, Santayana, Simmel, and Valerie. He recently completed a book on Brecht, Rodchenko, and Eisenstein, and a study of architectural modernism in Southern California. He is a founder and editor of nonsite.org. And he, uh, I believe it has just recently been announced, that he is the um, recipient of the Minor uh, White Archive grant and will be in residence there this year, for part of this year. So please uh, join me in welcoming Todd Cronin. Um, thank you so much, and thank you in particular to uh, Kate and to Julia for having me out here today. Um, it's been a really, um, it's a rare occasion to be able to attend a symposium on Minor White's work, so I'm absolutely thrilled to do that. And also a, a warm thanks to Charles for uh, shepherding me through the travels out here today. All right, do I do something or? The camera must report a revitalization, Minor White wrote in his memorable fancies, the artistic and autobiographical journal he kept throughout his career. What did he mean by revitalization? The world around us is vital, it is alive, but the photographer has to make it live again, live beyond its fleeting form in the reality experienced in everyday life. Revitalization is part of White's critique of documentary photography, one of his most frequent targets. He offered an analogy to understand the difference between art photography and documentary work. He described a man finding a piece of wood on the beach. At first, he says, the experience is rather indifferent. But let a man carve it, and something wonderful happens. It acquires additional life. What is this additional life? What happens to the wood when it's carved? The wood is still wood, but it's also somehow different. What is the difference? When the wood is carved, it bears the traces of human intent. And for White, that was all the difference in the world. In White's words, the documentarian's approach is like finding a piece of wood. The creative photographer's approach is like making a sculpture. Even an object lying on the beach has a life, but an increase of life when seen as a photograph." End quote. So while everything in the world bears vitality, when the world is captured by the camera lens, it becomes something more than itself. But how exactly is this a critique of documentary photography? If everything takes on new life when it's seen as a photograph, then documentary photography succeeds in the same way as a straight work. Neither Dorothea Lange nor White is actually carving anything in these photographs. And yet, White starkly contrasts his friend Lange's found life, her found tragedy, with the, quote, structured drama, conscious tragedy of the creative artist. Lang's title, Tractored Out, tells us something specific about the nature of this scene. So does Lang's charged angle of vision. She wants to draw the viewer directly into the scene, immersing her, as it were, in the farmer's shoes, walking his barren fields. Lang hopes to elicit horror and sympathy for the impoverished lives of the Depression-era farmer. White's title, by contrast, is geographic. The angle of vision is wider, the eye hovers above the field, it is an altogether more detached and inclusive view of the landscape. The furrowed fields slope upward beyond the house in the middle distance, and at the far horizon we are given a glimpse of a lake, 
which wraps around the upper edge along the right side of the photograph. There is a kind of perceptual puzzle in White's view, as a strip along the horizon could be mistaken for sky, a sense which is confounded by the wedge of water visible at top right. Lang's landscape, by contrast, is meant to feel closed, oppressively so. We are held to account for the world before us. White spaces in general tend to open out into distant reaches. They're often taken at, from a high angle, suggesting unknown spaces beyond the thing seen. White's photographs of Front Avenue are highly characteristic in this regard. Notice how the light falls on the buildings at the furthest reaches of the scene, as though luring the viewer into the distance with its expectant glow. Or consider this view of the Knapp Lindley House, which seems to revel in highly complicated intersections, creating perceptual puzzles. And notice, too, how the light seems to emanate from a space beyond what we see. White borrowed the notion of revitalization, of providing additional life for the things seen from his mentor, Edward Weston. Weston called his straight photographic practice seeing plus. Seeing plus is my approach, Weston wrote in his day books. Seeing alone would mean factual recording. The illustrator of catalogs does that. White had a special attitude toward the process of seeing plus one that was, I think, profoundly at odds with Weston's vision. Here, for instance, in New York City, on the right, White repurposes Weston's famous pepper, playing up to the hilt its bodily dimensions. The pepper seems to be in some sort of dialogue with the flowers, even, we might think, grabbing or touching them with its fingers. Seeing plus for White meant seeing everything as though it were on a stage all the elements playing a part for an unknown audience. So to my eyes, this photograph of Don Normark at Pebble Beach strays maybe into the ridiculous. Not, I'm not crazy about this one. Um, <laughs> but it has the virtue, I think, of showing the way white tended to treat landscape as something that interrelates or folds humans into the landscape, or even better, folds landscape into a human framework of meaning. Here's White in one of his most explicit statements of his artistic attitude. So this is White. What are the foundations of my thought? Hell, it's anthropomorphism. Man seeing himself in everything. For White, anthropomorphism was the key to human communication itself. The importance of anthropomorphism is this, White writes. If people are suggested to everybody, there's a common basis for experiencing the print that works for both photographer and the spectator. This common basis is the humanness. Humanness is the link, the bridge, the vehicle between photographer and spectator. And this, finally, is White's credo. The common basis between photographer and audience is humanness. To see everything as human was White's way of putting everything on a stage, everything and everyone performing a role for every other. Contrast this now with Weston's approach. For Weston, anthropomorphism was the plague. He was repeatedly accused of seeing bodies in everything, in his vegetables, in his rocks, in his barns, in his trees, but he refused this assertion over and over again. Weston's friend, Jean Charlot, took direct aim at White's anthropomorphism. This is Charlot. By bringing the world's diversity to a shameful common denominator in the human, the photographer disintegrates actual objects and people to such a degree that art becomes an artificial exercise." End quote. Indeed, Weston waged a continual battle against the charge of anthropomorphism, even though his critics never relented. White, on the other hand, embraced anthropomorphism to the hilt. Embraced it, we might say, abjectly. Because for White, without a shared basis in human feeling, the world was literally meaningless. So what I want to suggest today is that White's anthropomorphism was an essentially theatrical commitment. Indeed, the context for the passages from White I just cited occurred in the midst of a discussion of theater, specifically around a 1953 photographic series devoted to Robinson Jeffers' play, Dear Judas. White described the additional life of the photograph as, quote, the metamorphosis of a man into a part, 
the metamorphosis of a man into a part. What happened on the stage when the actor became his part was the transformation of life into art. What the actor was off stage was transformed into another life on the stage. The photographer's task was to show the world as actors performing on a stage, lifting the world out of its everyday context and giving objects a new life as photographs. White first engaged with the theater when he photographed performances at the Portland Civic Theater in 1939. And this is a still that's in the show uh, upstairs from Thornton Wilder's Our Town. Beginning in 1941, Don Marie, director of the Civic Theater, put on special performances for White so that he could produce stills that he would later exhibit for the actors. White wanted to show the actors a living mirror of their part so they could see, so they could visualize the character they had created. In other words, by photographing these special performances, White could edit together a series of individual gestures into a larger montage that would capture the spirit of the actor's role. What's, of course, special about this process is that White rejected the more obvious approach of photographing actors live on the stage, catching them unawares as they perform their roles. Indeed, White described the first step in photographic revitalization as the camera conscious portrait. He called this a step beyond the candid, the caught, the person photographed unaware. The candid is an experiment that had to be fully explored. I feel that for me, it is dead. It is a dead end, rather. We should pause here to take the measure of this provocative claim. Perhaps the defining quality of photographic modernism from Hill and Adamson in the 1940s through Edward Weston in the 1940s was a commitment to the candid, the caught, the person photographed unaware. In these two instances, the subjects are asleep and therefore definitively unaware of the cameraman and by extension, the viewer. White's approach, by contrast, no matter what the subject, seemed always to occur under the sign of the camera conscious or what I would call more broadly, theater. And while I can't elaborate on this claim here, I would add that Weston and Adams's landscape-driven practice was part of the wider history of candid photography. That is, for Weston and Adams, one of the most valued qualities of a landscape scene was its seeming incapacity to be camera conscious. Rocks, ocean, kelp, mountains, sand, shells, were constitutively unable to take notice of the photographer. They were unaware in their very being. Here, for instance, is an extreme, but by no means anomalous instance of Weston's commitment to photographing the world unaware. This is a kind of talisman, I think, um, for me, for a Weston's practice. The dead man, just as a rock or a pepper, is unable to acknowledge the beholder. I think what specifically attracted Weston to this subject was the fact with was the fact that the man was formally able to acknowledge, formally able to acknowledge the beholder, but no longer could. The only staging that Weston seemed to tolerate here was a simple turning of the body away from the beholder. It is as though a direct confrontation with a dead body would close down the merest capacity to see plus, but turning it away would retain an awareness with an extreme proximity that prevented any distraction from looking directly into the reality of non-human life. Ben Maddow rightly notes of this photograph that Weston was especially attracted to the beard that sprouts in rigor mortis, as though emphasizing the continuation of life force beyond human life. The point being that with dead man, one could finally see the human as a thing like sand or a pepper, rather than vice versa. Weston described his practice as the pure presentation of the world, a world stripped bare of what he called human interpretation. But was he right to see it this way? White did not think so. For White, the stripping clean of human meaning in Weston's work only threw the photographer's presence behind the camera into relief. So while the human content has been erased from the image, the artist's signature, his style, is all over the place. For White, Weston's photographs reeked in a certain sense of the photographer behind the lens, twisting and pulling the world into an inhuman shape. For, all his, for his all too human fingerprints were smeared across every bare rock, body, and vegetable. White simply saw no way forward for
for Weston's brand of presentational photography. The only way out was to reverse course and completely embrace human connotations. Looking at White's photographs, no matter what the subject is, one feels uncannily aware of the photographer's hand and eye, as though everything in his photographs are actors on a stage playing a part for an audience. And while it's true that White's works are saturated with a kind of theater, it'd be wrong to think that he's actually giving the work over to the audience. I don't think that would be the right way to see this. White wanted the audience to participate to a certain extent in the creation of the work's meaning. He wanted them to explore their associations, that's one of his favorite words, but he was nonetheless driven by the idea that through careful study, the photographer could control associations and steer the viewer's associations toward his own ends. White thought artistic communication occurred along the lines of what he called simply, and I think brilliantly, the main meaning, the same channel, the same area or level of feeling. In other words, opening the work up to the audience and, their so and studying how they reacted um, was a strategy to manage the meaning of his works in the face of its total dissolution in the free play of the audience's feelings. When White returned to Portland from Eastern Oregon in November of 1941, his friend Sue Martin at the Portland Civic Theater gave him a copy of Richard Boleslavsky's Acting, The First Six Lessons, a book originally written in 1933. By all accounts, it was a pivotal event in White's life. Looking back on this moment in 1973, White reflected how the lessons in Boleslavsky's book provided the essentials of creative work that could be applied to photography. The book, he said, was a major influence in my work. While in the army, he attempted, to write, he attempted to write the same material as Boleslavsky for photographers. And indeed, from 1942 until his discharge in September of 1945, White penned a kind of homage to Boleslavsky entitled Eight Lessons in Photography. The most immediate impact of Boleslavsky's book on theater emerged with White's first publication, When is Photography Creative? which appeared in American Photography in January of 1943. I'm going to call this the Oregon Essay. The Oregon Essay rested on a formative distinction between expressive and creative photography. Expressive photographers are individualistic, solipsistic, private. They do not make their pictures for the sake of an audience. Creative photographers, on the other hand, aim to arouse emotions in other people. Boleslavsky provocatively described the actor's job as an emotion maker. The actor created emotional states in, his, states in his audience like a logician, a mathematician, or a cabinet maker. Boleslavsky's last lesson on rhythm summed up the book on acting as a whole. Here he defined the work of art as the, and this is a quote from Boleslavsky that I think was very meaningful for White, the orderly, measurable changes of all the different elements comprised in a work of art to progressively stimulate the attention of the spectator and lead invariably to the final aim of the artist." End quote. White found in Boleslavsky a vision of the dramatic unfold, unfolding of scenes to invariably communicate the final aim of the artist. As White put the matter in 1947, at the time of his first photographic sequence, which I'm gonna address at the end of my talk, any fine photograph is open to numerous interpretations. A sequence, on the other hand, would guide the spectator to the intended meaning." End quote. White reflected on the process of emotion making in Aperture Magazine in 1956. Boleslavsky, he wrote, and this is, um, he lists 10 books that he thinks are essential for photographers, and Boleslavsky comes in as number four. Um, White reflected on the process of emotion making in Aperture Magazine in 1956. Boleslavsky, he wrote, taught the photographer how to be a methodical craftsman of feeling, to find a working technique applied specifically to the problems of evoking feeling and mood in people via the photograph. It is the knowledge, he said, of how to turn on and off at will a state of mind which one can create in the viewer. White summed up Bolesovsky's book this way, and it's, it's a line very similar to the line I gave you just a second ago from Bolesovsky. The final product of the actor's art is the feeling aroused in the spectator. In the Oregon essay, White provided readers with an example of the creative approach to emotion making in an audience. 
The scene is of a house along the beach with the ocean behind it, and the feeling it evokes is one of aloofness. But when the photographer comes to consider how to convey this feeling of aloofness to an audience through a lens and a print, he discovers the incompatibility between the medium, a camera medium, and the feeling he hopes to communicate. His point is that if the subject matter does not lend itself to the photographic medium, the subject must be dropped and a more suitably photographic variant found. White called this match between feeling and photograph pre-visualization, a term he borrowed from Edward Weston. The first half of the Oregon essay defends Weston's notion of pre-visualization. When the photographer pre-visualizes, White wrote, he looks at the scene, but, is, but he sees in his mind's eye a print of it. Printing from a pre-visualized negative is to get out of it the content remembered to have been inserted. Above and beyond this technical approach, White saw pre-visualization as a ritual practice. And I think this is really the crux of the matter. Pre-visualization, he said, is a discipline. When a man can do it, he's become one with his camera. Becoming one with the medium meant seeing had become seeing photographically. Here's White's most succinct formulation of the idea. I've made enough pictures so that now I see like a lens focused on a piece of film, act, act like a negative projected on a piece of sensitized paper, talk like a picture on a wall. It would be a mistake, I think, uh, to see pre-visualization as an idealist approach, one where there is, say, a separation between idea and execution, intent and realization, subject and object, inner and outer, mind and matter. Better is to see how pre-visualization aims to resolve the problem of the putative difference between intent and medium, internal idea, and material expression. An artist who has immersed himself in his medium is able to see the world in terms of his medium, rather than projecting or inserting some content into it from the outside. Edward Weston's, uh, in his 1924 portrait of Manuel Hernandez Galvan, offers something like an illustration of the concept of pre-visualization. Here, Galvan's concentrated gaze, looking out toward a peso, he's ostensibly shooting with his revolver at this very moment, both coin and gun out of view, was meant to exemplify the concentrated mode of photographic seeing, shooting the figurative target in some kind of quasi-instantaneous realization of idea and execution. So there stands my camera, Weston later wrote, focused, trained like a gun. White, by contrast, tended to avoid this kind of absorptive rendering of momentary connection, as well as the isolation of figure against ground. I think White refused that preferring instead to capture moments of what he called emotional rapport or emotional conflict between elements in his photographs as though they are playing a part in some mysterious play. And I'll just say as an aside, there's a, a really wonderful room upstairs where you can, I think is very indicative of this um, conflictual or rapport between elements in his photographs. You can see these all um, kind of side by side in the same room where he has two elements and they're even explicitly called out in the titles um, uh, so the lily pads and pike, the hand and the forge, the cable and the chain. There's a lot of like plus and and in his titles. Uh, I think that's that reaches right at the core of White's approach. Whereas Weston tends to isolate elements, um, uh, White wants to see a kind of conflict or grouping of elements. And again, I think this is a kind of staging or theater or drama. Photographing the ocean, for instance, this is the kind of conflicted emotions, right? Photographing the ocean, White says, brings to mind the conflicted feelings of good and harm, depth and shallow, pools and rocks. And here, too, I think uh, uh, White is following Boleslavsky, where Boleslavsky describes the nature of double feelings, of how an actor must be happy and sorry at the same time, gleaming and tender. Again, the two elements. The question White was asking was how to convey this ambivalent or conflictual uh, reality to an audience. White concluded that the best way to communicate the recurrent power of the ocean was not to photograph the ocean at all. 
here, white, too, white seems to be following Boleslavsky's famous notion of affective or emotional memory. Emotional memory was a kind of storage facility in the mind where feelings are kept for later use. White's fictive photographer traveled around the landscape with this emotional memory in his head and heart and sought out the right subject that would properly match the conflicted feeling. So he lists in the Oregon essay a series of possible subjects to capture this conflicted feeling, a field of, of uh, recurrent power, a field of grain, a series of fold-up snow fences, and finally he comes to a wind-eroded tree stump. The wind has shaped the stump, he says, in a marvelous fashion to form recurrent spirals swirling together like whirlpools stilled by a catastrophic hand. As usual, White's imagery moves from the natural to the cultural, as the hand sh that shapes the tree makes it into a conflictual form of a frozen whirlpool. Unlike the ocean, wheat, or fences, the wind-shaped stump, he says, will convey the feeling of recurrent power to anyone who looks at it. Okay, I think we've reached a problem here with White's practice. I don't think it's a theoretical problem, but I think it's an evaluative problem. Can it possibly be the case that anyone who looks at the photograph of the stump will experience the double feeling of recurrent power? More than that, White insisted that the double feeling would be available to anyone over and over again just by looking at it. This strikes me as impossibly optimistic. If White's case rested on these grounds that everyone will always and only feel what he wants them to feel, then White's project is, I think, a failure. But far more profound than the specific kinds of emotional realities he wanted to convey is his theoretical commitment to the project of universal communication. The great achievement, I would say, of White's practice is his complex account of communication of shared emotion through photographs that everyone looking at a work, no matter who they were, when they were, or what they were, would be able to share in a similar set of emotional qualities, not the same, but similar set of emotional qualities. It's far less important to me that White's photographs effectively communicated specific emotional states, sometimes they do, usually they don't, than that he tenaciously sought to break down the barrier between private and public, individual and universal. As everyone here is well aware, one of the central emotional states White wanted to communicate was his homosexuality. White's courage in representing this emotional reality was, I think, unprecedented for his time. His inner and outer struggles were at the root of a great deal of his work. And at the end, I'm gonna to come to his first photographic sequence devoted to this subject. But his way of treating this struggle, I think, is equally special. That's to say his complex feelings were above all human ones, and for that reason, accessible to everyone. White had a concise and inimitable way of putting the matter. Writing in his memorable fancies of a photographic sequence at an electric plant outside of San Francisco, he noted that, in my recent photos, there's frequently a penis between tall things. <laughs> Wish for intercourse? Who doesn't? Also a feeling of being alone expressed, who isn't alone? This shift from the personal to the universal was for White the necessary progression from expression to creation. White thought the impersonal nature of the camera automatically generated a first order distancing from personal expression. For those who are prone to print their hearts on their sleeves, White wrote, the camera image automatically provides aesthetic distance. It was the photographer's job to reinforce this automatic distance and to think of the audience's feelings as a version of their own. At the end of the Oregon essay, White introduced a crucial distinction between two types of creative work, objective and subjective. The subjective approach, White's own, aimed to understand all the possible implications of a subject and then extract the implication that best matched the idea in the artist's mind. According to White, the idea in the artist's mind might be utterly unrelated to the reality of that feeling in the photographic subject. And this again is his critique of documentary photography. In his example, whether or not a person photograph was in fact kind was irrelevant to the photographer who wanted to convey the emotion of kindness. 
which could be extracted from the face of an utterly disagreeable person. So White says. In Boleslavsky's terms, the actor must substitute creation for the real thing. The creation must be real, but that is the only reality that should be there. For White, when the viewer looked at the photograph, he should see the photographer's creation, something that went well beyond the expressive reality of the world recorded. What this meant was that the scene had to be recognized as created, had to appear as staged for an audience, even or especially if the photographic medium seemed to capture a reality caught unaware. So I want to turn my attention now and for the remainder of my time to White's first photographic sequence, The Temptation of St. Anthony is Mirrors. Uh, I, believe it, uh, I believe that this first sequence takes as its theme an unfolding narrative of the progress from expression to creation. Formally, this appears as the progress from the subject caught unaware to the camera conscious. Right, so expression to creation is the same as the caught unaware to the camera conscious. This is not the temptation. I'm gonna to come to it in just a second. I think it, it is best to approach the first sequence somewhat indirectly, to see it through White's own eyes, looking back on it about 15 years later. Writing to Edmund Teske, a struggling gay photographer in 1962, White admonished him to think about the distinction he first made in the Oregon essay about the difference between expressive and creative photography. It's a, a, a really incredible letter. Your photographs are still mirrors of yourself. In other words, your images are raw, the emotions naked. These are private images, not public ones. They are, this is all in italics, or underlined, they are expressive, meaning a direct mirror of yourself rather than creative. Still, this is still in the letter. Still recalling this earlier moment, White recommended that the photographer read Boleslavsky, acting the first six lessons, where he said, Boleslavsky described clothing of the naked emotions that is necessary to art. This is from the fourth of Boleslavsky's lessons. White, I think, is playing explicitly the role of a theater director to the actor in his exchange with Teske. Teske had sent White images of someone who, as White puts it in the same letter, had his sex wires crossed. Scenes White reflected of confusion, self-pity, anger, guilt, there is no end to it. The inner conflict is neither resolved by solution nor by death. White implored Teske to find the story, all caps, in the work, to universalize the images and make them available to others. Comparing Teske's works to those of Frederick Zummer, whose subject matter he insisted would make even you squirm, he found, <laughs> totally true, um, he found that they were capable of being mirrors of the man looking at them, mirrors of the man looking at them as well as being mirrors of himself. In brief, universality, appropriately addressed emotions and inner psychological events. For White, making photographs that only reflected the self was like narcissistically contemplating oneself in the mirror. Here's how White described it, again inimitably, in the memorable fancies. Why not just create for oneself? To do so, he said, is like masturbation. Only the self is pleased. This is expression. White identifies the progress from expression to creation as the, as the turn from masturbation to sex with another. To create for others is like copulation. The self is pleased and further rewarded in pleasing of another. Double giving is triple receiving, like reflections in mirrors facing each other. Okay, with this mirror imagery in mind, I would like to turn now to the first photographic sequence and its very ambiguous title, uh, The Temptation of St. Anthony is Mirrors of 1948. This was not exhibited in his lifetime and was first shown in public at the Getty Museum in 2014. This sequence was White's way of, looking, of working through the precise problem raised by Teske's photographs. St. Anthony's trial was a struggle to overcome expression and enter into creation, to progress from personal to universal. Who is being tempted here? The subject of the sequence, Tom Murphy. These are all photographs of Tom Murphy in the sequence. Or is it Murphy playing the role of St. Anthony? Again, it's got a theater to it. Acting out his biblical trials? Or is it M Minor White, tempted by Murphy? 
None of these, I think, is quite right. The temptation is mirrors. What tempted the monk was what tempted White, and what he saw tempting Teske. The temptation is expression, to turn the work of art into a private fantasy. It is the narcissistic temptation of mirrors, of self-regard, that is for White the standing threat to art. And it is, I suggest, the basic thematic material of much of White's work. A full 10 out of the 32 images that make up the temptation are de details of hands or feet. Numbers 3, 4, 5, 13, and 30 depict crossed hands draped over a chair back, the sitter's jacket folded over at the wrist. Numbers 6, 8, 10, and 32 depict Murphy's bare feet from just above the ankle, his pants folded in a manner similar to his jacket. Plate 16 shows a bare leg from the knee, bent knee down with two rocks before it. The rocks presumably signify instruments of self-punishment. At first glance, some of the plates, like 17 and 19, seem to mirror one another. But the point of the proximity would be to sensitize viewer to the differences between seemingly similar arrangements, to break down the mirror effect, here, for instance, in the way the sitter's right hand appears on his left thigh, the hidden arm suggestively concealing his torso on the other side of the photographic space. Other works in the sequence clearly feature Murphy's bare hands, like uh, 18, 20, and 31, and bare feet, as in 17 and 19, although now they're made part of the body's larger expressive life. It is highly likely that White was making use here of another passage in Boleslavsky's book, where he asked his student to study the hands of Botticelli, of Leonardo, of Raphael. Understand their weakness, that is the hand's weakness, their flower-like tenderness, their narrowness, their flexibility. Boleslavsky asks, asks his student to study in depth the way Leonardo da Vinci treats the hand in The Last Supper, and this is Boleslavsky. The key element here is the hand, underscored. It changes its position 26 times, 23 visible and three invisible. If you knew all the positions by heart and could freely change from one to another, building up their significance with each change, you would achieve a rhythm of that particular masterpiece. Seeing the hand in sequence, Seeing the hand in sequence, building up their significance with each change to create an overall rhythm is, I think, precisely what White is up to here. Plates three, four, and five, the top row, show the hand full of a kind of gestural symbolism. We might even say in positions, this is how I read it, shaking, gripping, and counting. Right? Shaking, gripping, and counting, something like that. There are also images of a body in motion, seemingly caught in the midst of an ongoing action. Reduced to hand gestures, they take no notice of the beholder, evoking instead an inward life beyond the photographic frame. With plate 13, the hand that's at the bottom left, the hand is now relaxed, passive, as though it's given up its role as, symbolic, as bearer of symbolic meaning. By the end, by the time we reach plate 30, the hand is, I want to say, reborn, given back a kind of inner life. The veins, once again, are surging with vitality but life no longer tied, I think, to a kind of conventional symbolism recorded in plates, one, uh, plates three, four, five. Consider now the first image of the sequence on the left. The first image of the sequence shows Murphy's naked body fitted here with White's proverbial fine piece of wood, a kind of iconography for his Anthony. He does not interact with the wood. He is reclusive, inward drawn, absorbed in himself, taking no notice of the beholder. The wood recurs in number 21 in the middle. Murphy's head is turned away, but now his body is angled outward toward the viewer. It is a conflictual image. The wood is angled across his body and once concealing his sex and exemplifying his virility. The wood reappears in number 28 on the right, now separated from a prostrate and sleeping body, Murphy's hand grazing the end of it along the floor, perhaps suggesting a kind of post-coital release. Other stills from the sequence offer focused details of the body, including the backside, 17 and 19, torso, 22, 24, and 29, arms, and head. These focused images of body parts, often shown in unfamiliar angles, strongly suggest Boleslavsky's double emotions of pain and satisfaction. A crucial turn in the sequence, I think, occurs with plate 23. 
where Tom Murphy, St. Anthony, drops his guard and faces the viewer squarely. Not exactly. Murphy at once looks out at the viewer, but his look is overlaid with iconographic signs. His saintly head is wrapped in a halo form, its artifice signaled by the glow of a lamp. At back right, Murphy is shadowed by an imploring woman in white by Picasso of 1923. In his Portland period, White used a closely similar setup with a nude standing next to Van Gogh's fishing boats on the beach of 1888. The iconographic wrappings around the figure become more and more overt. Their artifice, their staging more, made more apparent with every image, oh, which might leave us unprepared for what comes next. The final image, this one, number 33, which is my favorite one, actually. Um, the final image, number 33, in obvious reference to the life of Christ, is the least mysterious image of the sequence, a portrait bust of a fully dressed Tom Murphy, glasses on, head turned, and smiling, seems to insist on the difference between the photographer and his sitter. After the mirroring sequence that dragged Murphy through a figurative trial, Murphy is finally given back to himself. St. Anthony, it turns out, was the artist all along. The temptation was toward mirroring the self, toward self-expression, of making over, in this instance the straight, sitter into his desired object. But the temptation is not just whites. This is a temptation of every artist, to make the world over into a reflection of themselves, to turn the public into a private world. White was fond of quoting T.S. Eliot here, and he, he cited T.S. Eliot throughout his life. This phrase from tradition and the individual talent, I think strikes to the heart of White's aesthetic. The more, perfect, the more perfect the artist, the more completely separate in him will be the man who suffers and the mind which creates. The more perfectly will the mind digest and transmute the passions which are its material. The passage, passage from expression to creation, from self-mirroring to universal art, was the painful but necessary separation of the man who suffered from the artist that created. For Eliot, language separated a man from himself. For White, it was the camera. The objective recording mechanism of the lens detached the world from the artist's hands, but more importantly, White's theater, his staging of the world in humanly meaningful terms, reinforced the separation of the photographic subject from himself. The temptation begins with Murphy's body, giving us whole, offering himself up to the artist. By the end, Murphy is given back to himself. The central paradox of White's art was that the, the world only became itself once it was traveled through the space of theater, of artifice. Unlike Weston or Lang, White's subject could not be apprehended directly, but only indirectly by way of the conventions of art. Perhaps the closest White came to professing his creative credo occurs in the epigrams that introduce photographic sequences 15 and 17 from 1959 and 1963, largely pictures taken from Lake Mears, Oregon, and Capitol Reef National Monument in Utah. They share a near identical title. Out of my desire, seek to return you to yourself. And out of my love for you, I will give you back to yourself. White was always seeking to turn his desires into a gift to turn his love and his passion into a work of creation. The hope was always that with creation, he would find his perfect expression. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? I'm happy to take a question or two. Uh, thank you. I uh, was very excited about the prospect of seeing the uh, exhibit that's here now uh, in that I was born right in, in Portland in the middle of his tenure here. Mm -hmm. And I've been back four times now with other people of my generation and very puzzled by the photography in that it couldn't be any further removed from its subject matter. Um, it's a sanitized, sentimentalized version of the docks uh, and the industry along the river. 
but as I hear you, and this just may be the wrong application, but it seems to me if what's really important is not a documentary view of the noise and the, you know, <laughs> there's a very rough scene down there, uh, that really it's more of an expression of a, what a composition and form and tone uh, than it is actually a documentary of, of what he was actually taking a picture of. I'd be curious your reaction. To yeah, that. I think that's a great way of putting it. I think it's right to come to these photographs expecting a kind of high degree of grit and um, reality um, of the scene and then to be, as it were, almost shaken or shocked into what you called the kind of sanitation, but I would call the artistry, right? And it's meant, you're meant to have that kind of double take. Um, I think that's, it can go, I, I think what you're feeling maybe is that it goes too far sometimes, that it it's over sanitizes. And I think that's always the danger of the kind of this theatrical approach is that um, it becomes, yeah, I mean, it, at its worst, it can become kind of gimmicky. And that's what I was trying to suggest with the Don Normark. It goes too far into a kind of, it becomes slightly goofy at times. But it, I, that's not at all the case, I think, with the majority of White's work. Um, but you are, I think it's absolutely right to see it as a kind of, um, your immediate expectation is being frustrated by the aesthetic, which is the move, as I'm trying to suggest, between expression and creation. Yeah. Thank you, that's very helpful. Thanks, Todd. Um, sort of a statement leading into a question. Um, as you describe it, it sounds to me, it makes a lot of sense of the stuff we see about his occultism, his interest in Alvin Langdon Coburn, and so on. In hearing your description, it seems like he's moved away from the sort of precisionism, the medium specificity of a photographic modernism with someone like Weston towards a more European modernism. I'm thinking of Kandinsky wanting to play the audience like a piano or Mondrian trying to find a universal human language, these kind of larger aspirations of a broader modernist project. So I wonder if that resonates or is meaningful. And even so, and this is the question part, you know, that project more broadly is challenged uh, by post-structuralism and other approaches in the 60s and 70s. So I wonder if you think this is as strong of a description of, of White's total philosophy as I've ever heard, but does it carry any weight beyond the horizon of his lifetime? Does it set up further precedence kind of immediately around him or was it idiosyncratic to him? Yeah, great. So this is, that's a, oh, that would produce a pretty long answer, I think. Um, so my suggestion would be this, and I, I feel kind of strongly about this, is that the value of White is the depth to which he understood and um, took to the heart of the matter audience response. I don't think any photographer you know, on through Roland Barthes thought more deeply about the nature of audience response in Minor White. Um, I think he comes to a radically different conclusion with the same set of material. Um, so, and that is to say, um, he thought um, that he could um, try and understand how people thought so that they can communicate. Um, the danger with the punctum is, and I would, you know, have a lot to say in this matter, is that it's privacy. And, Bart says that as much. Um, then we are locked in our private experiences. Um, White wants to find a way in which something like we can dream together, if that doesn't sound too far out. But I think that's really what he thought, so that in your deepest recesses, you are not alone. Um, he didn't want to be alone, and I don't think that's a kind of specific to his biography. I think that's a human feeling. Um, so he's trying to find a way through a medium which does lend itself so strongly to a kind of uh, Roland Barthes type argument of individual responsiveness to find there the roots of something like connection. So I think that's a, I think that's a very profound project which certainly has ramifications um, nowadays. Um, in terms of the European uh, modernism, I, ooh, I'm not sure, I would, I mean, and this is kind of like what I do in my J job in a sense, I would want to say Kandinsky and Mondrian are kind of like at loggerheads. Um, and that there is a certain kind of Kandinsky type aspect of what White is saying here 
um, with one crucial proviso, Kandinsky doesn't care about associations at all. Um, whereas Minor White's thinking about human terms, whereas uh, Kandinsky thought he could isolate a line and see what it does to you. That's anathema to, to White. White's saturated in a kind of world of human emotions, which are conventional, historical, um, have nothing to do with the kind of like, you can get them in a Petri dish, which Kandinsky was committed to. So um, in that sense, I, th I want to say even more that White is kind of like, you know, offering some alternative to it, but also, so I, from, from my perspective, Kandinsky and post-structuralists are much closer to one another, um, and I've, I've written about this. Um, so, and then I think White and Mondra are doing something different, um, and I think this is a kind of continual conflict um, rather than a, a historical one. Thank you. Ken, want to? Oh. Ken has one. Maybe real quick. <laughs> uh, so um, this idea of transactions that he was after, getting an emotional response uh, from the viewer, I'm wondering if the ongoing presence of verse and poetry with the later post-war works, if that sort of indicated that he felt that photography as a medium had a had a shortcoming, or was he uh, after, was there sort of a intent behind the words paired with the images that sort of complemented uh, that, that attempt, basically? Yeah, I mean, you know, I think he takes the kind of, you know, in this sense, modernist and postmodernist affirm this in the sense that language has this distancing function to it. And he took that also that the camera has a kind of automatically distancing function to it. So in that sense, language and the camera worked similarly. But of course, there's no question that a photograph has the impact of reality. And he wanted to bring that, those two together to distance reality, which language, I think, for him was too distant already. He really want, I mean, he's a heart on his sleeve kind of guy. Um, but he's working through it in his photography. That's what I think is being narrativized in the photography, is working through this kind of singular uh, connection with the world into something that's shareable. Um, and so I, thought, I think that poetry would have been too detached from the beginning, um, w that he wanted more of that kind of emotional connection uh, that photography offered. But, um, you know, he's, it's a complicated subject, um, and, the, and the, how the titles and words relate to the sequences is a, is a whole subject onto itself. Um, so I don't really have a you know, strong view of that. But I, I would say that all of them are functioning as a way to um, displace that expressive connection um, in order to make it a kind of more shareable creation is his term for it. Thank you. Wow, Todd, thank you so, so much. Tried to force Brendan to go earlier today. Now is his actual turn. Brendan Fay is an assistant professor at Eastern Michigan University, where he teaches modern and contemporary art history in the School of Art and Design. He earned his PhD from Harvard in 2009 with a focus on photography, abstraction, and photographic education in the United States. His writing has appeared in History of Photography, Art Forum, Exposure, and the Detroit-based website Infinite Mile. Brendan serves as a member of the Minor White Project Committee at the Princeton University Art Museum. In cooperation with the Maholi Naj Foundation, he is also, he has in parentheses, slowly, working on a catalog raisonné of color photographs by Laszlo Maholi Naj. Please welcome Brendan Fay.
Thank you, Julia. Thank you, Julia and Charles, for the extraordinary hospitality here. It's really fantastic to see Portland, to see the show, to see the beautiful museum. Um, thank you, Kate, for the inspiration to bring us all together. Um, and since I'm in a thanking mood, thanks everybody for the time and attention today. Quick caveat first. I've stolen my title from the 19th century photographer, Peter Henry Emerson, who writes a very dogmatic treatise called Naturalistic Photography for Students of the Art. And I'm not gonna talk about Emerson, and I'm not going to apologize. Other than that, here we go. This talk examines Minor White's efforts as a writer and teacher in the 10 years following his departure from Portland, roughly 1943 to 1953. We'll be looking at a small number of White's Oregon era photographs and the second lives they start to live within an important collection of published and unpublished writings. White's Oregon photographs give us a through line, a thread to follow through a messy, unruly, and generative period in his career. They give us a narrow cross section through a much larger retrospective process. In the late 1940s and early 1950s, White began a process of sorting and sifting through his work to date, pulling apart old projects and sequences, and reshuffling and reorganizing his existing pictures in order to illustrate his evolving theories of photography and to support his evolving practice as an artist. By retracing his steps, we can isolate aspects of the process by which the minor white of Front Avenue and the downtown YMCA evolved into the minor white of Aperture Magazine and beyond. We'll proceed by way of three episodes, three instances where Oregon pictures get mixed into White's rapidly growing corpus of articles and book manuscripts. At each stop, I'll try to work somewhat backward, describing how White uses his Oregon photographs, what he aims to accomplish in these texts, and where those concerns emerge from a broad set of early influences. Let me begin somewhere in the middle. A reader paging through the 1952 American Annual of Photography would have encountered, somewhere near the middle of the volume, two of Minor White's Oregon photographs. You know them now from Ian's talk. They were about 10 years old at the time. One, from the spring of 1941, shows the cracked and furrowed earth of a farm in the Grand Ronde Valley in northeast Oregon. Another, from the winter of the same year, presents a partially solarized view of the distant Wallowa Mountains, seen from the Anthony Lakes. The first was included in White's landmark 1969 publication, Mirrors, Messages, Manifestations, and the second in Peter Bunnell's 1989 retrospective, The Eye That Shapes. Both photographs, in other words, have gone on to play a role in the public representation of White's early years. The American Annual of Photography was a yearly book format publication issued by the publishers of American Photography, a monthly popular interest photo magazine. In keeping with the magazine's general approach, the 1952 annual offered up a mishmash of disparate topics and points of view. Texts on Paul Strand and the story of tintypes by Walter Rosenblum and Beaumont Newhall, alongside technical articles on portrait lighting, soft focus lenses, and photomicrography, not to mention stereo pendulum patterns, alongside a listing, a telling one for our purposes, of who's who in pictorial photography. This is part of the long hangover of pictorialism Ian referred to earlier. Within this mix sat White's article called The Use of Space in Designing Pictures. His article aimed to describe five varieties of space or depicted depth that could be found in photographs. He was always teaching. He illustrated these varieties with eight of his own pictures, incorporating these two Oregon scenes alongside more recent work. The two Oregon pictures, not surprisingly, both illustrate kinds of deep space. In the moderately deep Cove Ranch photograph from the Grand Ronde Valley, White's text highlights the continuous incline of the ground plane to the middle distance. In the deep Wallowa Mountains photograph, he emphasizes the comparable incline of the sky. In this latter case especially, White asserts that depth and distance are, quote, primary to the meaning of the print, end quote. And that solarization in the foreground, in the brief explanation he provides in the article, quote, tends to add to the strangeness or to a thought that the present world is not so fine as one somewhere else. As one slowly recognizes how far away the mountains are, the meaning becomes felt." End quote. 
Many of us gathered here today will recognize White's trademark interpretive habits, even in that quick gloss. His constant leaning toward the metaphoric, the symbolic, the revelatory or spiritual. So it's worth remembering, on the one hand, that the first issue of Aperture has yet to be compiled at the time this article appears. And it's worth suspecting, on the other, that White has more in mind than a simple lesson in descriptive vocabulary. Indeed, White's declared goal was not merely to differentiate these varieties of space, but beyond that, to organize them into a system for the critical analysis of photographs. Early in the article, White asks, how many kinds of space are possible in photographs? But then he continues, quote, how do these relate to the emotional response of the spectator? What do they reveal of the photographer's temperament? End quote. We suddenly face three problems instead of one, a somewhat taller order. White's underlying goal, as it starts to show through here, was a single system that could organize, one, the visual qualities of photographs, the basic elements of style, two, typical spectator responses to each of those visual qualities, their basic emotional content, and three, the personal qualities that might shape a photographer's style, leading them toward a particular kind of image. Isolating space as one such formal variable, as a test case, he offered up what he called a ring diagram. Isn't that cute? Arranging his five modes in circular formation, from deep to moderate to opening, to limited to fluctuating and back to deep again, White marked out a set of points on a larger continuum, a system of differences without dead ends or binary oppositions. White insists in the text that these represent, quote, possibilities no one of which is any better or worse than any other, end quote, a set of equally valid options available to any photographer. That's what the Oregon pictures are here for to demonstrate White's own use of everything he describes. And that's also, I think, why they're published without dates, to avoid any developmental narrative among the pictures or the modes. And yet, and yet, he also tips his hand, revealing his own current preoccupations, when he notes that his ring format is, quote, chiefly valuable because the job of cataloging photographs that are unscaled or fluctuating is made easier. End quote. This was, we have to imagine, a more pressing concern for White than it was for his average reader. Let me put this another way. We see one of White's most characteristic strategies at work here, an attempt to build a receptive audience for his photographs by propounding a comprehensive theory for all photography. By the late 1940s, he was deeply invested in unscaled photographs and fluctuating spaces as showcased in his famous fourth sequence, which begins with the image on your right. He loved the way an unfamiliar texture or surface detail could oscillate, shifting from human scale toward the telescopic or microscopic. He also loved the way that ambiguity could delay or prevent one's recognition of the original subject. And the wraparound logic of White's ring diagram accommodates such seemingly abstract photographs without having to treat them as an exception as violations of some basic principle of photography. It was a clever solution to a problem he'd been pondering for at least five years, since encountering one important model for what a total theory might look like. So we rewind to 1945. Discharged from military service in the fall of that year, White had traveled to New York City, where he first met the historians and curators, Beaumont and Nancy Newhall, who we've spoken of today, and through them, a number of major photographers but he also enrolled in seminars with the venerable art historian Meyer Shapiro through the Extension Division at Columbia. Shapiro introduced White to one of the foundational texts in the field of art history, the German scholar Heinrich Wolfland's Principles of Art History. Wolfland's famous treatise had redefined the study of the Baroque, treating it not as a decline from some pinnacle in the Italian High Renaissance, but as a separate visual language corresponding to a separate worldview. Quote, neither a rise nor a decline from the classic, as Wolfman put it, but a totally different art. In White's understanding, Wolfman offered a system for describing differences in style without presuming or assigning differences in value. It struck White with the force of a revelation. There are lots of reasons for that, I think, but one factor had to be his range of early experiences. His own work in landscape, architectural documentation, portraiture, theater, 
his involvement with WPA documentation and camera clubs, his acquaintance with F64 and pictorialism. He already had a strong leaning toward the so-called straight photography of Weston or Adams, but recognized other desires in his own work and clearly felt an obligation to speak toward a broader field. With Shapiro's encouragement, and we must say Shapiro's reservations, White set out to rewrite Wolfen's system for the analysis of photographs. Wolfen's arguments were built around five sets of opposed terms or principles, the most famous being his contrast between the so-called linear style of Raphael and the painterly style of Rubens. He likewise contrasted the classic treatment of space as a series of receding planes with the continuous recession typical of the Baroque. In White's student papers, he began renaming some of Wolfland's principles and expanding or supplementing others, partly to deal with problem cases like the photogram. But at the core of his project, he also made a more drastic departure, deliberately removing the history from Wolfland's principles of art history. Wolfland had been concerned with changes in style over time, and he sought to locate individual styles within the constraints of period style. He insisted that, quote, not everything is possible at all times, end quote. White substituted a concern for the range of competing styles within his own time. His sense that nearly everything was indeed possible at once. In place of Wolfland's attention to the constraints of history, White began to substitute the constraints of medium. The principles of art history inspired White to begin constructing an analytical system, but White could never really bring himself to stay within the limits of his model. To understand why, consider a second appearance by White's Oregon era photographs. In 1951, readers of the monthly issues of American photography, rather than the annual, would once again have encountered White's farmland photograph from Eastern Oregon. It was in the July issue, in the second of a series of four articles White published that year. In the first article from May, it was preceded by two more images from 1940 and 41. Another farmland scene, plus a somewhat soft focus studio portrait. Unlike White's space article, with its sense of openness and its tone of neutral description, a very different and more prescriptive set of ideas will unfold across this series of texts. In the May article, titled Your Concepts Are Showing, two early pictures are called upon to illustrate a quote-unquote painterly approach to photography. In a studio portrait of the actress Barbara Spencer, White finds painterly qualities in his own use of dramatic lighting, staged or contrived pose, and matte printing. In the view of a rural farmhouse, White instead finds painterly qualities in a posterized effect, achieved through infrared film, and then secondarily in the internal framing provided by the trees, and in the reflections offered by the foreground pond. White's definition of painterly turns out to be extraordinarily broad. It begins from the typical markers of pictorialism, like soft focus images and hand manipulated prints. But over the course of the series of articles, it absorbs nearly any approach where a photographer interacts with their subject, say by composing a still life or directing a model. And it absorbs any approach that extends the photographer's creative process and decision making past the moment of exposure. That means cropping, it means layout and sequencing, it means exploration of the negative during printing, it means solarization, reticulation, and other darkroom trickery. It's a remarkable construction, a single category that basically equates pictorialism with photojournalism, with modernist experimentation. In place of painterly, White, label, White labels this whole range of approaches the camera as brush concept. The alternative, of course, is the hallowed ground of straight photography and pre-visualization. For the American photography series, White dubs this approach the, quote, camera as extension of vision. When our Grand Ron photograph reappears, it's in the July article telling us that it's possible to search exclusively for the revealing moment only in a world left as it is found. It's in an article called How to Find Your Own Approach to Photography as one example of an approach based on vision. White's language here talks on, tacks on some echoes of Wolflin, aligning this vision approach with a love of things as they are, and aligning the brush approach with things as they become. But to a certain extent, he's playing with a very familiar time-worn opposition. White's particular twist is to gather all that up and subject it to a double identification. On the one hand, 
he wants to identify each approach with a particular kind of person. There are brush people and there are vision people, so to speak. Those drawn to tinker and touch and those drawn to reflect and observe. He counsels the magazine's readers to locate themselves within that scheme and choose the methods characteristic of their personalities. On the other hand, he also wants to identify each approach with a particular kind of camera. Starting from a broad distinction between the view camera and the quote unquote miniature camera, by which he means any handheld camera that shoots roll film instead of sheet film, he aims to quote, keep us on the characteristic use, sorry, keep us on the path of the characteristic use of each, end quote. Now vision obviously belongs to the view camera, am I right? So White advances the curious argument that the painterly or brush attitude finds its natural outlet in something like the Leica. There's something funny about this, about linking the photojournalist's essential tool with a frustrated desire to paint. But White has an underlying logic laid out in the third article of the series. Roll film limits exposure control, since every frame on a roll receives the same development. That precludes true pre-visualization, so printing becomes an exploratory step of its own. And if you're gonna shoot first and see later, what better tool than a mobile camera that lets you immerse yourself in experience? Characteristic is White's guiding keyword here. He's trying to advance a theory of medium alongside a theory of creative practice and do it all with a single pair of terms. He wants the distinction between brush and vision to encompass the characteristic uses of cameras. He also wants those terms to explain what makes photographs characteristic of their makers. Making versus seeing neatly mapped onto miniature versus view. Now, as you might imagine, given White's deep connection to view camera traditions, this doesn't always feel like a fight between equals. At several points, he warns that the brush inclination, taken to its extremes, is likely to lead a photographer into frustration or out of photography. Vision, by contrast, is wrapped in the glowing language of absorption and awareness, faithfulness and creative freedom, sympathy, respect, revelation. The wonderfully complicated subtext is that White illustrates both approaches through the full series of four articles, entirely with his own work. Is this a self-refuting argument, or is something else happening here? I'm inclined to see an indication of the sources and inspirations and conflicts and contradictions he's struggling to synthesize at this moment. So let me retrace a timeline for a few minutes, because 1951 is a year of firsts for White. It's the year when many of his long simmering ideas first make it to publication, to press, but it's also the moment when he definitively begins using his own photographs to present those ideas. The linkage happens across six published articles, most of which I've touched on here, but they're really the tip of an iceberg. In 1946, White moves from New York on the left to San Francisco on the right. You were looking at the Western retrospective, White's adoring, loving photographs of the New Hall's Western retrospective at MoMA in 1946, and then Lisette Modell, his sometime partner in crime, out shooting in San Francisco in 1946, later in the year. He began teaching at the California School of Fine Arts with Ansel Adams, who quickly skipped town. By 1947, he was in pursuit of a master project he called Space Analysis. The project claimed an extraordinary amount of White's attention over the next five or six years, especially as it became deeply integrated with his classroom teaching. For the same reason, its exact parameters were constantly changing. White used his students as guinea pigs and collaborators. They encountered the Wolflin system as both assignment and tool, as a set of requirements for picture making and as a method for print interpretation. In letters and notes from 1947 and 1948, White imagines illustrating his masterpiece book to be with a mix of his own photographs and photographs made by his students. For a short phase in 1948, he reimagines the book as an analysis of canonical images, illustrations by Strand, Adams, Stieglitz, and the usual suspects, and imagined the students instead as model readers and viewers. They would be the source of emotional responses rather than the makers of illustrations. And the students remained in that role when White returned to the idea of illustrating with his own photographs, sometimes later in 1948. You can see where those 1951 articles are coming from at this point, yes? But there are a few more ideas we need in the mix. Some were emerging ideas, some were recurring ones. 
on the emerging side. 1948 and 1949 found White nearly obsessed with small format photography. His students were pressing him for technical instruction beyond the view camera. He wanted to figure out whether miniature work could match the expressive range of the view camera and whether he could absorb it into his Wolfen system. White's distinction between view cameras and miniature cameras comes straight out of the landmark volume published by Beaumont Newhall in 1938. This is one of the great groundbreaking uh, moments in the kind of history of photography, the study in the US. The idea first appears in White's writings somewhere between 1942 and 1945 in the unpublished manuscript Eight Lessons that Todd referred to earlier. But it shapes his work as an artist in the late 1940s with the sequence Intimations of Disaster as one important outcome. You'll see much of this effort gathered up in Exploratory Camera, the lead article that opens the inaugural issue of Aperture. On the recurring side, we can look back to a Guggenheim proposal that White submits in 1946. In his proposal of that year, not funded, he signals at him his ambition to write one or more book-length publications for aspiring photographers. The book, or books, would treat three major ideas, each with an obvious source. The first he called space and style analysis. This was a direct continuation of his rewriting or adaptation of Wolfland's principles. The second idea he called the creative condition. This was about the mental and emotional training of photographers, about inner growth. It was a direct continuation of his rewriting or adaptation of Boleslavsky, as Todd described earlier. And Boleslavsky's dialogue format carries over even into White's 1951 series of articles. He just couldn't shake that template as a kind of writing mode. The third idea in White's Guggenheim proposal was equivalence, or the use of photographs as metaphors. White took the word and the idea straight from Alfred Stieglitz, but he couldn't leave well enough alone. One of White's earliest published texts, as we just discussed, is the 1943 article, When is Photography Creative? There, he offers two basic paths for photographers, seeing things in and of themselves, and using things to visualize other ideas. Both locate creativity in seeing. So far, so Stieglitz. But then he describes a third kind of creativity that arises with portraiture, the interpersonal collaborative building of a, quote, mutual feeling between photographer and subject, end quote. A similar idea pops up in a 1948 letter to Nancy Newhall, who was always his closest interlocutor. Quote, I know very well that during the past two years, the students have been working out my problems. It's not exactly fair to them, but what can I do? I can't stop creating just because the medium veers from camera to student frequently, end quote. Vision versus involvement. This sounds a lot like the opposition between vision and brush in that 1951 series. White spent the decade of the 1940s trying to build that into a strict either-or choice, with the weight of Newhall and Adams and the straight photographic tradition pressing on him the whole time. So was White a vision guy or a brush guy? I don't think he was willing to choose. And by 1950 or so, he had shifted his approach to illustrating his own arguments. He started gathering up his work to date as a foundation for the work to come. So the Oregon pictures that start to appear in his publications play an aspirational role. They mark a hope that all these branching paths and either-or choices that White was tracing through photography might turn out to be a single path. Episode three takes place in the archive and takes us into the pages of a sprawling, unpublished, three-volume manuscript. The manuscript carries the lofty title, Fundamentals of Style in Photography and the Elements of Reading Photographs. In letters, though, White started calling it How to Read Photographs, and he used that title for volumes two and three. It's the closest White gets to integrating all his early concerns in a single place. The most complete copy at the Harvard Art Museum contains more than 200 small silver prints attached to its pages. Just call me the Scotch Tape Kid, he writes to Adams after finishing production in the fall of 1953. Seven of White's Oregon photographs are scattered across the illustrations to this manuscript, and they're typically used to introduce small formal principles. A false Solomon seal from the Eastern Hills exemplifies a few varieties of line. Our familiar farm, yet again, illustrates moderate space, receding smoothly but stopping short of the sublime. By contrast, 
A mountain boulder shows us space organized in planes with a corresponding sense of obstruction. And another Oregon farm scene in the lower right here shows us what White calls perforated space, depth seen through a kind of screen or grill. In a related image, lower left, we see a farm building as an example of closed shapes and closed forms, compositional strategies that give a picture a sense of completeness unto itself. Line and plane, open and closed form. You can see that White is still using Wolfland's principles as an underlying armature although he's added another layer of distinctions between small concepts, like texture and line, and large concepts, like space, light, or composition. But another Oregon farm scene in the upper right, with the silly tree there, starts to show what else he's adding to the idea of reading photographs. It says here, this tree is a kind of clown. It's offered as an example of anthropomorphism, or the projection of human qualities onto inanimate and natural forms. A final Oregon photograph showing a train and grain elevator near Alisal, Oregon, serves as a more comprehensive reading exercise and as a major waypoint in this manuscript. It's near the end of volume two. Here, White uses some creative cropping to model the process of reading, of isolating different formal qualities. You see he's taken two diagonal slices in the two successive pages there, and he's trying to capture the stasis of the architecture against the implied movement of train and sky. The text follows up with a checklist that notes, beautifully, how space, light, tone, and texture reinforce a first impression of the picture based on movement. He ultimately argues that the picture is about the central place of the grain elevator with, within all of these vectors of movement that wrap around it, underscoring its importance to an agricultural region. The design, he notes, simply restates what the objects state. Now, by White's own description, this is an easy picture. It's about the things it shows, and it is, quote, easy to stay within its main meaning, end quote. It doesn't pull us toward flights of fancy. As a result, it helps us see what the Oregon pictures are doing in this manuscript, the supporting roles they play, and it helps us see what the manuscript does as a whole. It's a reading lesson for beginners, taken from White's beginnings. It embodies the idea that some photographs do provide us with an experience of their subject matter, and sets up the idea that other photographs might provide us with something else. White ultimately phrases this as a distinction between bridges to experience and sources of experience, photographs we see through and photographs we see, complete experiences in themselves. By way of conclusion, let me try to extract a couple things that happen along the way. One. White's interest in cropping and exploration gets shifted from making to viewing. In the American photography articles, cropping and exploring the negative were linked to a painterly approach. That whole distinction between miniature and view cameras disappears in this later manuscript, while cropping becomes a tool for teaching us to see. But when you turn from the grain elevator to the third volume, that cropping technique, the teaching technique, gets applied to photographs that have had much deeper personal associations for White. There's a portrait of Tom Murphy on the Pacific Coast, taken from the series Song Without Words, one of his early meditations on his desire for men. And then there's the concluding image of the fourth sequence, shot on the sacred ground of Point Lobos. You've got the full image and a small thumbnail there upper left, and then sort of different crops he takes through it on successive pages. A sequence that he once summarized as equivalents of sex that were basic as hell, right? This is like beginner white from his point of view. But the 1953 manuscript totally desexualizes these pictures and yet also holds them out as places where we should seek deep meanings. Two, white starts to locate the meaning of a photograph in reception, in the viewer's experience of an image. This is an unwieldy idea and in many ways white handles it crudely but he has an interesting argument for what this should mean to photographers. In short, he counsels them to become the best and first readers of their own work. In so many words, he argues that the only way to secure an intentional meaning in a photograph is to treat it as an unintentional object, to hold it at arm's length, to see it as others might see it, and then to own or reject those meanings accordingly. Almost in passing, he suggests that one kind of person might actually possess that sort of omniscient or universal understanding. That person, of course, is 
the mystic. If you've ever opened a copy of Aperture, you know where this story goes. But White grounds the argument in a personal anecdote and in a singular image. The last of White's photographs to appear in this unpublished 1953 manuscript is Burning Bush, taken in 1946. It's an exposure from near Stinson Beach, taken in his first semester in California. Quote, the particular photograph above is pure accident, White explains. Quote, a leak in the bellows caused the light, he continues, and then asks, has the photographer the right to show this as his work? End quote. He answers in the affirmative. Quote, it is an outright statement of religious mysticism, symbol and all. I can claim it as my own because it is directly in the path of my own direction in photography. It is backed up by many pictures that were not accidents, that were made on purpose with every bit of technique at my command. Directly in the path. That's my basic idea about the afterlife of White's Oregon images. On a surface level, they provided White with a set of illustrations and reading exercises. They help us recognize the scope of the synthesis White felt obligated to provide as he struggled to define creative photography as a field of activity. And they help us recognize the generative contradictions among all those sources he gathered in support of that task. But on another level, they helped him validate his evolving approach, his emerging mystical leanings, by suggesting he'd been walking that path all along. The only way, after all, is the way through camera work. Thank you. Sorry, I should say out loud, if there are any questions. I'd love to see what I can do. Sorry, Charles was moving with the mic already, so I figured we all had this covered. And if not, that's cool too. Thanks, Charles. So as a steward of some of Miner's earliest photographs, I, I think you absolutely prove the point in the way that he looks at them and uses them later more as illustrations than his fully fledged work. Uh, did you find anywhere a sense that he was at all further dismissive, dismissive of his organ work, of um, not embarrassed by it, but I know oftentimes uh, artists are very unfavorable toward their very early work because they know how immature they are. Did you get a sense that he felt that at any point about these images, or do they just become a different form of his own education that he uses to his advantage later? I have a slightly different sense of what happens from here. Um, and I have to say, one of the, I'm gonna go with the tangent first and then the answer second. One of the really glorious things about being here to see this show is realizing just how much I love so many of these early photographs you have on view right now, and just how much the very best pictures he makes in Oregon are not the ones he's using when he's playing around with his work in the 1940s. Um, and I think some of that has to do with the experience of dropping all his negatives in a rep repository and heading off on a boat. Um, Right, I have sort of a, an absence of evidence there, so I can't play with the idea much further. Um, but I think there's a kind of bottleneck that all of his work gets squeezed through in the early 1950s. Everything gets put through this kind of formal analysis rigor. Ringer, sorry, is the word I'm looking for. And then he comes out with this sense on the far side. I don't, don't know if I've ever thought of it these terms, but Mondrian actually seems apposite here. Um, this sense of all of these works he's built over time as cards in a deck that he can reshuffle and redeploy and put back in play. Um, and there are places, right? We had reference to that article earlier when an Oregon writer was sort of puzzling at sequence 13, this poetic sequence, when it comes here in 1959. And sequence 13 is effectively a remix of the images he includes in this unpublished manuscript, right? There is a sort of template that gets established in the early 1950s with this text that he ne can never actually get to prep 
like get to press, get published, of the career representation as a kind of remix, right? And so even though here it feels like he's turning each of these works into these really kind of dry, like here's space, here's line, whatever, it also frees him up to kind of crack those loose of some of the early sequences, the early projects, right? Here's where this came from, here's how I mixed it the first time, so that everything becomes up for grabs for the next sequence, for the next project, right? For kind of getting mixed and matched. Um, and since I'm rambling anyway, I feel like one of the strange outgrowths of this, I was thinking about this earlier today, there are a lot of early pictures, ones from the show, also just pictures from elsewhere, that are always surprises to me when I encounter them out in the wild. I see that, I'm like, wow, that's a great picture. I didn't recognize that. And then I turn back to Peter Bennell's catalog, and I realize that it's in there somewhere, and I've just forgotten that he included it. And I think the biggest reason for that is that that book, which is still the book of record on White, follows this mix and match remixing strategy that White had in his own career, right? It's not a chronological catalog, even though it's got the chronological section. And so in a way, I mean, I think Bunnell trained us very inten intentionally to see the photographs out of order in this kind of everything up for grabs relationship to each other. And it takes some deliberate effort to work from that back to something like strict chronology. Fortunately, Catherine is on the job, so we're gonna get there, but. Um, <laughs> Right, and I have a question for you about the unpublished manuscript, the three volumes. Yeah. Um, I have two questions, hopefully both fairly straightforward. One, do you have any sense from your work of why that three volume manuscript remains unpublished? Uh, and two, uh, especially in light of your talk today and my awareness of Meyer White's role in, at Aperture, I'm starting to have a sense that he succeeds greatly with the article and perhaps fails with the book form. And I'm just, this is very, this is just coming off of the thought that this huge tome that's solely illustrated with his own work never makes it to print and yet we have a six part series of articles. and. Just could you speak to that or, or, or tell me I'm wildly off base? Thanks. No, I think that is, that's a beautiful way of describing the state of affairs. I think that's totally accurate. Um, just in case he's watching on YouTube right now, I will go ahead and say that I'm allowed to say this because Peter said it once. I think part of the problem was that White was kind of a terrible writer, right? I mean, he, he worked extraordinarily hard at it and it, like, that kind of didactic writing was not his genuine talent. Right, and I say this as somebody who has devoted years of my life to reading White's words. He was just not the best writer out there. Um, and in some way, right, my fascination with him is actually not because I think he got it all figured out in the end. I think he's like fascinating precisely because he was somebody who was so dedicated to the search, whether he ever actually got to the answers or not. Right, I mean, there's this kind of just like open-ended, unfinished quality to everything he does. Um, and as you start to plow through the archive, right, we've each kind of picked in different portions of it. Other people have worked through different years. It's like he's always got this albatross at any given moment in his life, right? There's always the unpublished and unpublishable book in progress sitting next to him wherever he goes. And I think each one of those unpublishable books just kind of evolves into the next unpublishable book manuscript somewhere. It's like he could do the photograph and the sequence and the article and the magazine itself, right? Aperture is his kind of total work of art but the book with the compact arc, he couldn't quite swing, and I think part of it is that in 1953, it's because he hasn't decided which book he wants to write or which argument he wants to make, right? Is he teaching formal analysis or is he teaching deep spiritual self-growth through contemplation of photographs? He doesn't know, right? He wants both at the same time, and he's got no idea how to manage that. I couldn't either. Um, I feel like that was most of the question. Are there parts of the question of missed? Well, just, just if you have found any evidence that he was sort of actively soliciting any publishers uh, he, and, and... He sent this manuscript out to publishers. Okay, and, and the Harvard one, the, the one that's now at yeah, Harvard. Yeah, the, yeah, the Harvard okay. one. That I, yeah, he, he tries sending that out and people are like, thanks, thanks, no thanks. <laughs> and that was my, yeah, um, so people do respond and they just sort of say thanks, but no thanks. Yep, and I think on some level, huh. right, again, you know, ap sort of aperture rather than a book becomes the consummation of this. On some level, he wants this really didactic teacherly book to be an actual instructional volume and also be a kind of sequence and image text combination all at the same time. Like he wants it to sort of be a, a lesson and a work of art all at once, and that's a pretty tall order. I mean, like Stephen Shore gets a little bit of that, but I think his 
sets his sights a lot lower when he publishes the nature of photographs. So, um, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is not an argument, more like a near parochial meander, I guess. But I, you can you this, make it an argument? Yeah, no, I don't. I don't. I don't want to assign myself to the argument form of this. But it's something I wonder about when I read this stuff. You had a, a line that was kind of almost like a laugh throwaway line about how he did all this work to, to create a universal theory of photography to justify generating interest in his own body of work. Yep. Um, so I just wonder if you can elaborate on that slightly from the angle of, it, it does seem, as someone who seems interested in pedagogy, like a kind of ethical problem to develop a, a methodology that is purely inductive based on one's own work. And as you say, uses students as guinea pigs and so on and so on. But this is a person who clearly cares about teaching, but as you say, he doesn't even know what he wants to teach on some level. So I just, right. that's why it's not an argument or a question, but I just wonder if you can just expand a little bit. No, I think there are, there are some pretty real ethical issues that you get into with White as a teacher. I mean, he's trying to figure out on the fly what it means to teach photography in a college setting in the first place, plus he's got all of this, right, deeply philosophical or psychobabble-ish stuff he's trying to layer into that process, and he's really, right, you know, is he hands-on or is he hands-off? He's kind of both of those things at the same time. He gets really involved in people's personal lives. He's always got some sort of cohort of people following him from place to place. Um, yeah, I, th I think ethics is a pretty good question to ask there, and some of the answers are actually a little uncomfortable at times. Um, right, and then that idea of the total theory, right, I feel like he, he grabs that early on, right, and I think some of that, right, wh whatever the explanations are, it's overdetermined. There's more than one factor. Um, I think some of that is queerness, and some of that is real insider access, and some of that is probably the interaction between those two. The sense of having some kind of self that couldn't be spoken out loud, right? I mean, his sexuality was an open secret with everybody who knew him on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's also what gets him fired in 1952, right? Um, right, and somebody who's so early in their career is connected to Adams and Weston and Newhall and Bernice, Ad I mean, like, all of the central players. Right, it's, it's Weston who tells him that he should number his negatives and start keeping proof cards. Um, and I think it's one of the new halls who tells him he should be keeping carbon copies of all of his letters because a bunch of nerds are gonna wanna read this stuff in 2018, right? He's got this really weird, <laughs> extraordinary insider access for somebody who also doesn't fit. Um, and so I wanna try to tack on a thought I didn't quite get formulated as Todd was finishing speaking. Thinking about the, the way you're starting to line up Bart and white as sort of post-war figures, um, and I can't wait to see where you go with this. I have always thought of Roland Barthes' book, Camera Lucida, it's one of the kind of classroom classics on photography at this point, as a book that is fundamentally about the private experience of the public photograph. Right, Bart is primarily reading this landscape of media images, of mass media photographs, I mean, Avedons and magazines, stuff like that, right, and finding a way to read himself into those pictures in spite of the fact that they come from a world that tells him he shouldn't exist. And in some ways, White's inversion of that is always trying to build the public experience of the private photograph, right? To take something that's really about deep experience, inner identity, conflict, discomfort, I mean, the man was not comfortable in his skin from day one to day last, and turn that into something that can kind of go travel safely in the world out there. Um, and I think I'm sort of seeing for the first time, hearing stuff today, Right, the private experience of the public photograph and the public experience of the private photograph are both fundamentally about queerness when you look at where White and Bart are coming from. Right, that's like a huge just part of, right, reading yourself into a world that doesn't make a place for you or rebuilding a world that starts to make, like it's, yeah. Yeah, that's as far as I can verbalize the thought, but there's something there that we will hopefully get to hear more about in the very near future. I think the, the one question I think is a technical question yeah. that is a, as a technical photographer and trained in the zone system, looking at the pr printing of his photographs is difficult in technology. And I think that that time, a lot of those people couldn't get their stuff printed the way they wanted to. They were so technical in the curves that they were trying to achieve that when they were printed in their printed form, they just didn't go. 
And so you're right in your aperture analogy, because we read that in, in photo history. Yep. Those are, those are just examples that that's the best they could get at that time to show you what it looked like. So when I, as a, as a, as a photo major, saw that, but when I went and see um, Adams's or Minas originals, that's a whole different theory. Yeah. Okay, you have to, you're just looking at what he's interpreting, saying this is what we see as an image of this big, but when you get there and look at it, it's a whole different image of that, and that curve technology is really an issue, and I don't think it's ever been resolved at this point. So um, the Japanese printing technology is much more advanced than our technology in printing those curves, but it's really hard to do that. Um, and so accepting that and printing that book of those images, like you're saying, those other images, uh, it's gonna be a hard process. Yeah, and I think he so, stomachs enough of that to get ideas out in press, but that may be another thing on this list of challenges that gets in the way of the book, the sort of magnum opus. Yeah. Yeah, and his, right, ultimately the encounter he wanted you to have with his photographs was you in a room in complete silence for two or three hours, and then maybe after that you'd have something to talk about. Another one. I was a photo major also, but I'm also a printer, a journeyman printer. And what we could make happen with photographs where they were, we were trying to get those full zones, what we could make happen on a process camera to go onto a printed page, what we could do at the end of my active career with Photoshop and digital stuff were a whole different world. So my question is, I wonder if he would have actually printed the book if he could have done it with digital printing where there was so much more control of especially shadows and those darker, the heavier midtones. It's a lovely thought, and there are a couple people in the room who know how to pull the strings on that kind of thing. We can, you know, I, I won't make Kate talk about this while the mic's turned on, but we can think about permissions later. <laughs> Thanks again, everybody. Oh my goodness, my brain is overflowing. There's still room in there though. Still room, I hope you have room too. We're gonna switch modes just a little bit and go back to a more conversational situation, if you will. Our next session is called Legacy, Minor White's Relevance to Contemporary Practice, which is up on my screen. There it goes. And this will be a conversation between Kate Boussard and Aspen Mays. Kate Boussard, who is uh, my co-organizer of today's event, is the Peter C. Bunnell Curator of Photography at the Princeton University Art Museum. Most recently, she co-authored an award-winning publication exploring the intersection of photography, architecture, and urban studies. That book and the accompanying exhibition are entitled The City Lost and Found, Capturing New York, Chicago, and Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980, which was published in 2014. She is also the co-author of Color Rush, American Color Photography from Stieglitz to Sherman, 2013, and author of So the Story Goes, photographs by Tina Barney, Philip Lorca de Corsia, Nan Golden, Sally Mann, and Larry Sultan of 2006. Her doctoral research on street photography at the City University of New York is the subject of Unfamiliar Streets, the photographs of Richard Avedon, Charles Moore, Martha Rossler, and Philip Lorca de Corsia, published in 2014. Aspen Mays. Aspen received her MFA in photography from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in 2009. She has had solo exhibitions of her work higher, uh, at Higher Pictures in New York and at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. 
Her work has also been included in exhibitions at the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art and the Columbus Museum of Art. Aspen was a 2009 to 2010 Fulbright Fellow in Santiago, Chile, where she spent time with astrophysicists using the world's most advanced telescopes to look at the sky. She is currently assistant professor at California College of the Arts and lives and works in the San Francisco Bay Area. Please welcome Aspen and Kate. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Aspen, for agreeing to do this conversation about Minor White's legacy. My pleasure. It's really, um, I would like to thank everyone as well. It's, it's, been, it's been such a rich conversation so far today. I feel, I feel the same way. My brain is so full of thoughts and ideas, but thank you so much for organizing this. So the way we have structured the conversation um, is that Aspen's going to walk us through uh, some of her own photographic work. For those of you who don't know it, I was realizing when Julia was reading your bio that we've known each other now nearly a decade. <laughs> so I know Aspen's work uh, from uh, her days at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, um, but we wanted to share it all with you and have her talk about it in the context of this day. And then importantly, um, and most recently for Aspen and I, we've been having conversations about a, a curatorial effort that Aspen undertook where Minor White, I think it's fair to say, sort of pulsed uh, throughout the thinking around an exhibition. And in this way, I think we'll tie back both to the exhibition that has brought us here, that Julia has organized, um, and to things like the exhibition uh, that Val spoke to earlier this morning for those of you who could join us. And we're gonna try to do this uh, quickly enough that then there's time to fold all of you into the, question, into the conversation as well. So think of questions as we chat. Okay, good. All right, so I'm gonna start with this image and, um, and it, is a, it is a photograph. It's not a broken projector at this point. And <laughs> I, I start with this a lot when I do artist talks and everyone's like, check, you know, get a, they want the AV to come out. So um, this is a photograph that I made when I was in Chicago. Um, and I, I didn't, I've kept the title away because that's part of the reveal and something I hope we talk about a little bit more with Miner's work and his influence in my thinking. But I made this image, I set out to make a landscape photograph um, in the summertime around twilight of fireflies. Um, I was at a residency in Michigan and I know in the Bay Area we don't have fireflies. Same thing here, right? No lightning bugs. So I set out to make a landscape photograph of that time of the day when the, when the fireflies come out and found it to be um, really unsatisfying and really hard to do, to time it just right for when they're gonna light up and to guess about it. So in order to make this picture, I, I captured some of the bugs and just opened the back of the camera and dumped them inside and closed the back of the camera and kept the lens cap on and just just clicked slowly through the exposure. So this photo, this is a photograph of firefly light on film. Um, and to me, it was sort of um, a way to get at what the experience is and also to point to how utterly strange it is to see it this way too, to be forced back into a rectangle, to look like a color field painting, to, to not be anything like waiting for that moment when they're gonna light up um, as a kind of, miracle of photography and a kind of failure at the same time to actually replicate experience, to see it some, in a different way. Um, yeah, I don't wanna stop you from jumping in. But, um, you know, the segue for me was, it was an image like this, which is, it was actually some, an image that was sort of in my mind as, as, a, as that problem, that this picture to me is about what it feels like to see that reflection from the sun less about what it is, what it, that reflection is. And that, that was sort of what I, that problem I was encountering when I made that Fireflies image. And making that Fireflies image was a sort of turning point in my practice as well. Did you have Minor White in mind when you're setting out to do what started as a landscape photograph? You know, this is one of those pictures that when I first encountered it as a student, you know, before graduate school, well before graduate school, um, sort of lodged in my in my mind as as getting at that problem, like wanting it to feel like this, mm -hmm. 
and finding that so often it doesn't. So I do think a picture like this was sort of rattling in my mind um, when I when I just reversed that that moment when I put them inside instead of trying to photograph them outside. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Let's see some more. Uh, so here's another work that I've made. So this is a this is an, a button that I've made in an unlimited edition. So I think I've made several thousand at this point, and I, I'm. I decided that the caveat was I would stop producing the button when this photograph exists. Um, so I guess we'll keep waiting um, for a little bit. Could be any day now. Uh, but it really reminded me a little bit of that last um, talk, that, that obsession with the search. Uh, this button is really an homage to Stuart Brand. He made a button um, in the 1960s that said, why haven't we seen a photograph of the, whole uni uh, of the whole Earth yet? And it was right before the whole Earth catalog was published and the first photograph of the Earth as seen from space was published. So it's, a, it's totally a, a utopian kind of call to action and it's paranoid at the same time. It kind of does all those things. So I just wanted to up the ante and, and talk about um, the whole universe. But it really, to me, speaks also to a kind of lingering um, aspect of my practice that I think has been brought up in such, um, in so many interesting terms today that that obsession with could there be some sort of transcendent knowledge? It, if, if this photograph exists, what would we then understand about being alive? What would we then understand about having the key, some sort of universal key? How would we find the humanness in a photograph of the entire universe, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and that's something that I, I think of that as sort of a thing that I've come back to constantly as a kind of holding that as an open question in my work. So, um, yes, so this was, this was in, in preparing for today, we talked a little bit and, uh, and I was thinking about the way that for me as someone who's not a minor or white scholar uh, by any stretch of the imagination, but someone who is the steward of the minor white archive at Princeton University Art Museum, um, I am always struck by what I first uh, see when I look at the photograph and the way that that is almost always thwarted by Minor White's titling. And this one came to mind and, and relates to some images that Aspen, I think, come right after this, um, where the first time I saw this, I, 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 I'm not even sure it was a print in person. I think it was a, a thumbnail uh, on a printout. Um, and I thought it was the night sky, right? And, and so then the title, of course, locates you differently. It places a reality onto the photograph that is different than maybe that perception. And we've, this has been really eloquently uh, summarized, you know, this idea of, of taking the infinite and making it intimate. Um, uh, or, or the ways in which uh, Ian talked about the transformation of the landscape. And, and yet it all hinges on the reveal of the title. Right. Um, and that that becomes such an important anchor. And even thinking about the way that geography plays such a pivotal role in Minor White's titling systems, um, that in fact you can do a geography search on the Minor White Archive website, um, so that you can you start with a map of the world, uh, and you see where Minor went and photographed based on the knowledge we have available and the geodata available. But also thinking when I was hearing Val talk about the fabulous exhibition that I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get to see, the way in which. Um, Minor White's titling and specificity around his locations in Portland probably facilitated a certain kind of that matching project with the architectural fragments. Um, so that, you know, the title is not Portland, Oregon, and poor Val has to like think about the whole of Portland's historic buildings and wonder <laughs> where on earth Minor White is taking an image. So it's, for me, this is, this is the push-pull that frequently happens with Minor White, and I, th I feel a similar one with your work, and maybe the punched-out ones are a good example of that. Yeah, absolutely, and, it, and it, I think that really came into play with Fireflies as well. The, I didn't, the title is a print, it's a long descriptive title about fireflies inside the body of my camera with the exact time period, you know, several minutes and the date and all that, and the, 
and the location. So, I mean, that really was a part, in my mind, to sort of play off the romanticism of the idea of doing it and the action of doing it, but also to just give this totally, that, that moment where you're brought right back into what it is. It just is what it is. It, you're, you're being asked to imagine what it means, but mm -hmm. the information is just the information. Right. Um, which is a nice segue into this work. So this is, an, um, this is a, a work of art that I made when I, when I was on Fulbright, um, as Julia mentioned in, in the introduction. And the piece that I made is, actual, is the actual archival sil silver, um, silver gelatin print. And the, the piece itself is quite small. It's about the size of a postcard. So I was working um, in a, a, a dark room at the National Astronomical Observatory in Chile that was was not no longer in use for any sort of um, observational science, and I was given access to it as sort of like I guess you can here you go if you want to use this space you can. And I found several discarded photographs. I think this one I found in a trash can, um, and it's an image taken through a telescope of the night sky without any sort of contextualizing logbook or description or any sort of title. And um, my intervention into that, uh, first, aside from just, I sat and stared at it probably every day for almost a year and just thought it was perfect already, you know, as what it was. And, and finally um, decided to, I took a hole puncher and just removed every star from the photograph. Um, so the title of that work is Punched Out Stars. Here's another one from that series. I think I found 12 photographic prints altogether. This one, um, is also about four by six inches. So you're seeing a photographic representation of the work itself. Just hope that's clear. Also, an, I'll show an install shot in, in a little bit where you'll see this, how small the scale is. Um, and I'll show one more here. And I, I really wanted to, to see how much information I could remove from the image and still have it be an image. It's also, um, the hole punch is still a celestial shape in a way, so it's still sort of a replication of the information that was removed. Um, it calls to mind um, miners writing in, around equivalence, around the idea that if, if you can't discern the subject, then you invent a subject. If you're open to it, then you'll invent a subject for it. And that's something that has definitely influenced my work and continues to influence my work. Great. Do we, I forget what comes next. Oh, <laughs> surprise. So oh, yes. some more work Good. that I made um, at the same time when I was uh, uh, living in Chile in a Fulbright was, uh, was this work, and this is from um, a larger piece that I call The Sun, 1957, and I found um, sets of negatives labeled by the month and the year. So March, or what is this one? What does this one say? July. This is July, 1957. So it would just be in a box of negatives. So I made, um, I lined them up and made contact prints. Uh, so each individual circle is a is an individual negative of the sun. I think it was from a sunspot survey, I, I'm, but I'm also guessing. Um, I found some correspondence in that dark room asking for images of the sun in the 50s. So I think you know I put it together, but no, none of the astronomers still working there ha had used that dark room. I mean, it was just totally abandoned and useless for science. And I'm sure all of our archive people that we heard from <laughs> earlier like just cringing when you see punched out stars and you're like. Just because you didn't find the logbook doesn't mean you get to destroy it. Um, I guess that's the joy of being an artist and not an archivist, right? Um, <laughs> so um, I made I, I I intentionally lined these up per month, and they weren't labeled by the day. So I, I wanted them, I, and I also used paper that I'd found in that dark room, okay. um, expired paper. And, and you're seeing some artifacts on, on the surface of the paper itself. It doesn't show up as well in, in representation, but I think the artifacts compete for significance. They're as significant a mark as a sunspot. Mm -hmm. And so that collapse of scale um, that happens that I think Minor White also writes about. I, I think I, I pulled something, too, to talk about that. Um, and this is something that I, I think about all the time, especially in scientific imagery, um, to, to so aggressively assert subjectivity into scientific imagery has been something that I've returned to over and over again. And I'll read from um, The Light Sensitive Mirage. While we feel sure that if we had stood beside the camera, we had we would have seen the same subject the same way. We carelessly mistake the photographic rendition for authenticity and rarely realize just how extensive a mental adjustment we make every time we look at a photograph. 
Mm-hmm. And so for me, especially in, in astronomical photography, we won't ever even see that. You cannot see this. Right. It only right. can exist as a photograph. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that was something, and that is something that I think about, uh, I, I return to over and over again, and I think a lot of people kind of touched on that today in really interesting ways. This just gives you a sense of um, the complete set. So I will also mention that I'd never found November so this is the sun, 1957. I don't know if it was cloudy every day in November <laughs> or what. I wasn't there. So um, I wanted, I, I, I think, again, to kind of point back to that, the search, the kind of obsession with totality that if you just could know, if you could see what it looked like every day, right. you would have some sort of universal understanding of it. Right. When, in fact, I think that's always elusive. It's just a fantasy, Sure. ultimately. Sure. One can imagine the sun, 2018, and that it might not be significantly different, or at least right. not in ways that are perceivable in this kind of photograph. Right, right, and, and you have a kind of amazing amount of information, and yet you sort of also know, know very little at all. It's not right. brought much new to the table in, in the same way. It also gives you a sense, just to give you a sense of scale, each print is, a, is about 11 by 14, just kind of, and there's 25 prints in this series. I printed them all by month. And this also gives you um, just a sense of how small the punch-out stars are. Mm-hmm. They're quite small. Um. Oh, good. <laughs> Bringing so, it back. Yeah, so we part. saw these earlier today. Um, this is, a, you know, you're going to get another example of, of the proof cards, which are these, uh, you know, five by seven index cards that... Um, in most cases in the archive have a contact print on the front. Um, and then uh, in instances like this, just sort of a glorious amount of information, both prosaic and more profound. Right, and something like this is so attractive to me. I mean, the proof cards are something I've had my eye on for a few years because, because in fact, they're, they're just index cards. I mean, you saw from Punched Out Stars, it's like it's just there's so much in such a small space and it's it's exactly that it's every, it's it's everything you want it to be and then also so this is just the information here and this one in particular to kind of circle back to this image where you know the description is weighted you know no, what does it say notice this at breakfast I, yeah um seen at breakfast four days previously waited for sun to make it but above it you know of course see memorable fancy dated 20th july of 1958 so that there's the recollection of the observation, but also pointing someone to a cross-referencing in the archive. Already in 58, he's doing this. That yeah. level of organization is beyond charming. <laughs> yes, I feel a little shamed by it already today. I'm like, <laughs> oh, I gotta get it together. Um, gotta swing for the fences, I guess, right? Um, but no, I think this sort of, um, think, reflecting on this, of course, this is a much, Looking at this proof card is, you know, wasn't contemporaneous contemporaneous to me making fireflies, for example. But in preparing for this talk and considering it, um, that sort of information has become even more interesting to me, also as an artist and an artist thinking about archives. Yeah. And so I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about one more snippet of work, and then uh, I think the next slides after this are are of the exhibition that I curated that Kate mentioned earlier. So this is from um, a, a recent body of work, and um, there, this is a photogram, um, this image is, and, and it, it's using, this is actually silver gelatin paper also, it was a kind of novelty paper that was made, I think this paper was made in the, in the 70s or 80s that I got my hands on. Um, so I'm just explaining that for all the photo, I feel like we're amongst photo nerds, yes. um, but, but the paper stock is that color blue. This isn't toned or anything like that, just to get all the information yeah. in. Um, and so this photogram is based on a bandana that belonged to my great-grandmother. That was a very cherished personal object that I have from her. So the title of this piece is Elizabeth Gray, that was her name. And I'll show you a picture of the, the, the bandana in just, a, in just a moment. It was a kind of a pale pink scarf that she wore. And I always, I, and I've loved it and have always loved it, and it, I've been attracted to it because it is this kind of starburst pattern. It's a it suggests something celestial, and also maybe it wasn't, and it was something worn on her body. That kind of collapsing of scale again. So I made this by copying the pattern. I, I kind of cut a, a, a template for it, a mask of the pattern, and then just repeated it over and over and over again. So. Um, 
you can the uh, you'll see from from the image of the bandana itself that it's just this one central pattern, and I just kept printing on top of it. I would turn it and, and make it over and over again as a kind of, to me, a way to get closer to um, that process of replicating it was almost a way to make it closer to her or some sort of m more ecstatic right. experience. Or also just thinking about that the, the pattern of the bandana is visible, legible when flattened, but, but your repurposing of it through the mask and and through the the reprinting um, is like sort of the act of enfolding the bandana which of course to put it on to wear it to have it in contact with the body is to actually hide the in, the entirety of the pattern right right yeah and um you know and I think of when I when I reflect on thinking about minor white in my work um or thinking about it for on the occasion of this conversation, you know, I think about a sort of permission to consider the, an emotional component, right? And it, not even permission, a sort of like a call to consider on it, an insistence yeah. on it, and something that I felt for years trying to photograph the bandana itself and so unsatisfied. This paper also came in red and yellow. It was a really amazing paper. It came in a variety pack. Huh. So I made um, I made us uh, one in each color. Yeah. Um, just to give you a few more detail shots, this is the red one, um, and here's the yellow, where you can really see that pattern sort of meandering all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then this is an image of it it, uh, uh, of it itself. And you know, I, fo I photographed it on and off over the years and felt unsatisfied by it because it felt like it didn't somehow get what you were saying, like somehow that unfolding it or revealing it was, was just missing from this. It didn't have an emotional dimension to me the way that the photograms did. Oh, and here's one last one um, where I actually did use the, the scarf to make a photogram and fold it and put it together so that the central image, the central shape is the same kind of diamond shape, but it's a, an actual void instead. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so we'll transition yeah, to talking sure. about the, um, the exhibition. So this was an exhibition that I curated um, in 2015 at Higher Pictures in New York. And I was invited to curate it. Um, Kim Boris, the owner of the gallery, had s mailed me um, a, a, a book in the mail that was um, Photography Sees the Surface, written by the Czech modernist um, Jeremy Funke. And she had sent it to me, and it's sort of that, it, it sort of a lot of things that we've been talking about today. Like, a, you know, it was a photographic manual mm -hmm. extolling the, the power of of photography is the way to, to, you know, describe all the details in the world. It, it, it was a modern, you know, European modernist text. Right. And as a really provocative title to consider uh, surface. And, and one of the ways that I started thinking about this exhibition, he was a, also um, an educator and right. the book is also a pedagogical tool for him. And so as I was starting to consider that as a, as a reason to put these images together, Minor White was one of the first people that popped into my mind as well. Um, I remember, I mean, we started talking, I think, around that time when you first got the invitation to do the show, um, to see, you know, wh how that, how Minor White could, could feature in it. And of course, surface is a really interesting word that we haven't maybe talked about as much today as, as I, I might have thought, but perhaps that is because we're at the beginnings of Minor White rather than the endings of it, but certainly by a certain point in his career, surfaces dominate in a really powerful way. Right, and... Um, well, this is perfect, yeah. Yeah, and this is, so that was something I really wanted to try to consider in a really non-linear, kind of all over the place way, as you'll see as I walk you through some of the work that I chose for this show. But, um, yeah, the idea that surface is revel could be revelatory, could also be a description, just a description, um, that it could, refer to sight and insight, you know, that it has a kind of the dual, duality that's contained in that word or its implication. And, and I also kind of took it as an occasion to look through my own influences and I could trace my own family tree or lineage and as a photographer who has taught me. And so I, I selected people for this exhibition that were either my teachers, were my teacher's teachers, or were my students or former students or who are people who also actively teach. So everyone in the exhibition sort of intersect, intersects and intersected pedagogy as well. Um, 
So this was one of the, I, I had one, originally wanted the proof card. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm looking I was at like, Kate, I'm like, those don't leave the building. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the 1970s anymore. They do not leave the building. I know, and you see what I do to archival material. So Kate probably <laughs> made a wise decision to not let that out of her sights. Um, anyway, so, but, the, but this image from that last slide, I don't know if you can see it, if it's, it's pretty low quality, but you can see back there, that image was included, um, that, that piece is included. And I noticed it was titled Beginnings and also not that, anyway, so that's an interesting kind of tie back in. Um, so another image from the show, or a work from the show, is a, is a piece by Linda Connor, who is someone who I took classes from um, when I was in San Francisco, kind of after undergrad, taking kind of workshops and things like that. Linda Connor is faculty at, at the San Francisco Art Institute, which is, of course, what turned into the institution where um, White started. Right. Um, and I had always assumed that he was her teacher. And, and I think in my mythology, that was it. And I emailed her before when I was preparing this, and she was like, no, I think I met him one time on the East Coast. I was like, oh, well. She showed his work quite a bit. Um, and was the first person who introduced me to Minor White's work. And certainly, um, Linda's, the title of Linda's class that I, that I took was The Sacred and Profane. So I mean, her, she, was, she is and was certainly someone who, as an educator, implores you to consider that emotional dimension or the possibility or the humanistic or the, the kind of that intersection. So this is a, a piece of hers where she, re, she printed work from the Lick Astronomical Observatory. So you also see this influence in my work yes. very clearly. And it's, it's made on printing out paper and it's a cracked glass plate negative. So that, um, that void in the center and then the kind of the crack of the glass becoming really the composition of the work. And of course, it's pointing to deep space. Right. Um, here's another, <laughs> this is a total wild card in the show too. Um, this is good, right, because <laughs> walk, us, walk us through this because I, this is, this for me is, is a, if, if part of the show was built around a kind of family tree, this is the moment where maybe like the limb breaks and it's falling off. Yep. <laughs> but hasn't totally hit the ground. Right, I'm gonna try to reattach the limb for you. Um, <laughs> so this was, <laughs> when I started putting the show together, at that time I was teaching at Ohio State, um, the Ohio State, excuse me, and um, I, I did include a piece in the show, also a man, from a Man Ray, a Man Ray photogram from his teaching portfolio, there was a, a, a a teaching portfolio inside our the Ohio State Archive. So it was meant for you to bring students to see it, and I brought my students to see it all the time. Mm -hmm. And so I included that work in the show, and I just sort of snoop, started snooping around Ohio State Archives to see what else might be interesting to put in here, and a, an archive that they're known for is the John Glenn Archive. Um, he was from Ohio, um, one of famous Ohioans and a, a proud Ohioan at that. And I started looking through that archive and I came across, I don't even know, this is one of those deep dives yeah. into the archive. And I came across this image, um, which is a, an image of um, a parade held in his honor. So it's taken from an airplane. I'm gonna read you what the letter says because I, I'm sure you can't read it from back there. Let me see, I think I typed it. Um, it says, let's see, it's dated 1998. Senator John Glenn enclosed is a picture taken from a J3 Cub by Grand Tronic, Grand Tonic Air Photo on your homecoming parade in New Concord, Ohio. Thought it would be of interest to you and your family found in a box saved of my late mother and dad. Wish you the best of luck and health on your October space flight, George Grand Tonic. So, you know, for me, the this would be a moment of divergence, also, or an interest where uh, I, f I feel as an artist, um, a kind of skepticism of Minor White's um, treatises that, in fact, this is a vernacular image that I think is so loaded with meaning and emotion and potential that was taken, you know, kind of almost remotely from, a, from an airplane. And so it's a picture of an astronaut walking on Earth being celebrated, but it's taken from above. <laughs> but it sort of just like collapses. And when you know, when you read that letter, that letter has this kind of poetic dimension mm -hmm. um, that I felt was a sort of weird wild card to add into the show. But, even, but in the conversations of today, the designing of space and the question of intention and this is is the, can we call this a created photograph right. or a creative photograph and I think some of the same questions circulate around this even if it's vernacular and right. anonymous right yeah. yeah absolutely um and so that was something that 
I wanted that kind of was a wild card to me. And then this is a this is a piece that really also informed my thinking quite a bit in the exhibition. This is a piece by an artist named Gina Osterlo, and the title is. Um, Let's see, let me get it right. Uh, Nothing to see here never was. And this is, she painted that text on a photographic backdrop and photographed it with a four by five. So it kind of goes back into it being a flat, looks like a flat composition. Mm-hmm. And and to me, this is the sort of counterpoint that is, is exactly what it says it was. There's nothing to see here, that it's only surface. It can only ever be surface. Right, and also that the photographic backdrop is most often a surface that is meant to register photographically as not being there. Right, as being so invisible. It, like, right, so it has this gentle curve so that it is invisible. Right, so this was a kind of other counterpoint uh, on which I kind of organized the exhibition. She's also a teacher. Um, but to, to kind of insist that maybe surface, surface is all you ever get. We could say that maybe. So here's another um, wall kind of installation shot from the exhibition and um, you can see the actual window. This wall was full of windows, the photograph, ph- photographic depictions of windows. And, and as, as a kind of nod back to thinking about right. um, White's preoccupation with windows and sur- window surfaces and their metaphorical potential. Right. Right. Um, we could do a whole <laughs> revisiting of windows and mirrors just yeah. with minor white. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly, and the history of, and so many, and that's been such a, um, an archetype of, photogra- of photographic practice, sure. still is, and probably always will be. So these are two images that I included in the exhibition. Uh, here on the left is John Opera, um, which is actually a cyanotype of this, of a, the blinds in a window. And then on the right is Justin James Reed, an untitled photograph of that kind of incredible void, that mm-hmm. kind of punched out wall. Um, thinking about those sort of, clearly they have a kind of visual conversation with each other and also what they're depicting again, where it's kind of like, is it surface? Is it, is it revelatory? What, what is it? Where does it stop? Where does it kind of expand? Um, here's another one, Empty Head, which you all probably know well. And I think this, the, to me, this is another instance where that invitation to read into, to, to see the anthrop- anthropomorphizing that we've been talking about, um, it, you know, hearkening back to the previous slide, the way that the void of Justin James Reed begs so many more questions than it answers. Right, absolutely. Um, and while I didn't include this particular image in the exhibition, it was definitely on my mind um, when I was looking through, considering what to include, and I did include this image, um, a student of mine made, um, where he was, yeah, this is totally amazing. He was, he was freezing um, photographic chemistry into little, you know, he would get like a tub and pour it in the proper, you know, developer, then stop and fix and freeze it in the freezer and take it out and then set it on top of a piece of light sensitive, you know, on silver gelatin paper and let it melt. As I know, (laughs) everyone's just sort of like, I know he was, um, so he would do these in the darkroom and this was one of them that was too perfect. It also looks like the girl with the pearl earring or something like that (laughs) too, it's totally amazing. But I was absolutely thinking about Empty Head when I um, put this piece in as this kind of process piece that it's all process, it's total chance. Um, and yet, and yet, it's not pure abstraction, right? Exactly. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, another work by, and I and I hung those two, this piece and the piece before together. Another, this is another former student of mine named Jackie Furtado, and it's a photograph of her grandfather. And and I think, um, you know, in speaking with her about his role in, in her family, it, you, in the title of this piece is Home Ruler. So you you see the kind of dimension of this work and her decision to print it this way, her decision to obscure his face in shadow and to heighten that effect. Um, her decision in photographing it, but also in the way that she chose to print it, right. and which is something that I think um, we've has been talked about really eloquently today, but also the, what those proof cards feel like they make so plain to me, all those decisions that go into trying to elicit a particular response. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think one of the things that is is hard to convey in a gathering like this, but has become completely evident to me every time I dip a toe into the archive, 
is that almost without question, every time we get, say, a request to publish an image, because we maintain the rights to the work, I'll get this very helpful list from Catherine's team saying, right, okay, here's the, all the prints in the collection for that negative. Please go in the archive and tell us which of those prints we're releasing the image file for. Mm, that's interesting. And yeah. so without question, every time this happens, the prints vary wildly. Um, and some of that has to do with a you can see some changes chronologically, even in this kind of anti-chronological career that we've been talking about. Um, you can see slightly different croppings. Mm -hmm. You can see mounted and unmounted. And, and that variety is, um, is always kind of wondrous to me, even as someone, even, even as he's thinking so carefully about how someone's going to react to the photograph, it still never arrives at a singular version of any particular print, or very, very rarely, or it's not the ones I'm coming across. Right. But this, the, that he's, he's always, he feels to me someone always of multiples, um, that there are always multiple answers to whatever problem or question the negative poses. Right. No, that's so, um, that is so interesting. And I remember when I first started out, when I first started studying photography and you first step into the dark room and you, I just remember being sort of astounded by how much control returns to you after you decide to make an exposure, that you enter that space and all of a sudden you have this whole, these whole host of decisions to be made again that, I remember th kind of thinking, like, does everybody know this? Like, this is supposed to be so objective. Like, you get this message. That's the magic, right? And then you get in there, and it's like, well, what if I did this? And I'll cut mm -hmm. this out, and I'll obscure this. And mm -hmm. dodging and burning was sort of a total um, revolution. I didn't include this work in the slideshow, but I, I found several dodging and burning tools in the dark room in Chile, oh, and right. I just was sort of collapsed my mind that right like why does a dark room a scientific dark room what right. are they doing with dodging and burning tools what were they doing with the dodging and burning tools no <laughs> but but what th that you also think about the technology required the, to in the telescope mm -hmm. the, the kind of staggering amount of technology going on even just to produce an image from a telescope and then in order to actually see the image somebody's in there with a pencil you know taped to a piece of paper <laughs> Dodging and burning, I mean, just, um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that sort of stuff is just amazing to me. Yeah. As an artist, feels like a rich territory. Yeah, I, that, that anecdote never stops making <laughs> my head explode. Yeah, no, I remember finding them and thinking, like, what is, it? oh, my God, it's a dodging tool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I don't know how we are on time, but this, we can, oh, okay, we can open up yeah. to other questions, comments. <laughs> Julia, thank you. <laughs> thank you. And I hesitate to ask this because of the nature of today's event, uh, but minor has meant so, so much to you. Are there others who come even close to the type of um, nurturing, if you will, that you get from him? Uh, or... And again, I don't want to cast this as your work being in any way derivative or anything like that. It's just that we all come from somewhere and we do follow uh, those who are important to us. And I'm just curious if there are others who light your path to a certain extent. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, I, would I would also say maybe to frame that, um, and maybe part of what I was trying to do with that exhibition was to really just also think more broadly about pedagogy. Um, and, and I would say I feel very influenced by the teachers that I've had and maybe less directly with their work per se, maybe sometimes yes and sometimes no. Um, I think I encountered Minor White's work when I was just starting and I think it loomed, there was a sort of permission that it gave or a sort of insistence to consider another, like it, to me it sort of raised the stakes or at least 
the suggestion was like, oh, but it, are the stakes transcendence? Is that what we're talking about? This thing could also do that. That, I, that has stayed with me while I don't know that I think look to his work in the same way. It's maybe become, it was fun to put this together and to think through and certainly and you can see in that exhibition. It was something that I tried to like connect the dots and then also not connect the dots. Um, but it, yeah, I don't know, but there's something sticky about it for me, clearly, because um, it kind of gave a permission that I think has stayed with me. And it kind of, certainly in thinking through scientific imagery, uh, my own insistence on pointing towards subjectivity, even in that imagery, or, or certainly pointing to the role that interpretation still has to play in that imagery. Whereas I think a lot of scientific imagery and science in general takes the place of a kind of spiritual spiritualism in a way that it, it claims to describe the world, that it could give you a kind of holistic picture, but it doesn't tell you how to live with that information. And I think that's what art maybe could do, maybe sort of sometimes. I almost wish we had Brendan's slide back up here telling us what the probable feelings associated with deep space <laughs> <laughs> were, were, were likely to be, um, because I, I sort of recall that they, they on that list, they were the ones that uh, alluded to that kind of transcendence or a, a, a possible spiritual angle. And I would say I, I feel totally openly skeptical about that also. I mean, I would say an open question in my work is, is it possible? Is, is it even, is that possible? And trying to, I hope, hold that question up and put it in tension. I, uh, right before we got up here, I also told him I'm totally gonna make a button that, that's, that circle diagram that says space. So just look out for that. <laughs> I just wonder if I might, sorry. Um, so I was thinking of the, the Utah photograph with the bullet holes, and um, I was just telling Julia that that's Robert Adams' favorite minor white photograph. And he says quite a bit about the titling of it, that his experience completely changes. He vastly prefers the one where it's titled, because uh, it gives it some grip on reality. Um, I'm, I, I guess I, wanna, I just want to ask you about this notion of transcendence and what you mean by it. Uh, be because I gather that for white, transcendence doesn't necessarily mean getting beyond us, but it actually means being us, um, being us in our own skins, as though for the first time, so we can kind of re-experience ourselves in the world rather than out of the world. So um, maybe another way to put this is, do you see the, the whole punches as ironizing their efforts or, or re-establishing their efforts? Is it, I mean, you, you're talking about the burning and dodging. I mean, in a certain sense, I think Minor White would say it's like we're just burning and dodging all day long. This is mm -hmm. what we do as yeah. humans. Right, right, right. <laughs> that's funny. Um, but I didn't mean to cut you off. No. That. Yeah, uh, that's a great question. And um, I, I think of trans when I think of transcendence or how I think about it in my work or how I think about it in science um, is more a sort of to total picture like transcendent knowledge where you could you could zoom out to that level and see it all that it, that I think a lot of that the project in astronomy you know like the photograph of the whole universe like there is some way to arrive at the total picture that I think um, points towards I think you're right that, that I'm thinking about it a little bit more of like seeing outside of ourselves where I agree with what the distinction that you're making in punch out stars I thought of that as a kind of uh, like a matching gesture, less interested in irony, although it's certainly winking uh, a bit, but more as a sort of replicating the fragility of the experience of looking and the fragility of thinking that, um, yeah, that how fragile that experience is actually and how fragile it is to sort of make a telescope and point it at the sky and try to see something and try to kind of understand, try to wrap your mind around what all of that is. So to me, w without finding that context for those pictures, like what they were looking at or what they were studying, the removal felt a kind of like a matching gesture. And I don't know if that makes sense at all. Probably not. But great question. Well, if there aren't others, then I think we should move on to our concluding wrap-up session. Thank you all.
Tim, I have this mic. Um, for our concluding discussion, uh, it's a bit of a roundup free for all. And I'd like to invite our participants back up to the stage so that we can uh, sort of gather together. And we're more than happy to take any questions or any thoughts from the audience as well. Um, but it might be a nice time for us to just, uh, I know that I've learned a lot today and have a lot of extra things to think about, certainly. Uh, so we'd love it if we can just uh, get together and chew on the issues a little bit further before um, we all turn around and go back to our respective cities and maybe enjoy a little beautiful weather while we're here. And I'm just gonna jump in um, and say uh, thank you broadly uh, to Julie for providing, to Julia for providing the beautiful exhibitions that prompted this. I wish I were coming back to see the second one, the refresh, um, but, but the, this long uh, stretch of minor white on view here in Portland uh, gave us such a wonderful opportunity. Um, and certainly want to thank the folks here in Portland, uh, especially Charles, for making so much possible today. Um, and I also just want to take this opportunity to, to be very clear that the minor white archive at Princeton University Art Museum is public it is not a closed archive. So if you are like these people to my left and my right, um, curious about learning more and seeing more of Minor White's prints or his thinking about pedagogy or his writing, however good or bad it may be, um, please come visit us. Uh, you can find me online, you can make an appointment. Um, and then, as, as was alluded to in the introduction uh, for, for Todd, um, there is a research grant that we administer for making research possible in the Minor White Archive, because uh, one thing we have learned definitively is that uh, the archive will be better uh, for being visited by more people who have far more knowledge than I do, <laughs> and will um, we learn something every time someone comes to the archive. So if you have questions about that, please go online and look up more information or talk to me. But most of all, thank you for today. I have uh, multiple thoughts. We don't need to go through all of them because others on the panel might have some too, but I thought maybe I'd, I'd start. Um, in preparing for this day and then in the past week, actively, almost nonstop preparing for today, uh, I took to thinking about what it means for so many people to gather within one room, individuals who, I'm not a minor white scholar either, but there are multiple people here who consistently work with him, with his body of work, with his archive. Um, Ken, you've been really close to this information for a number of decades and the information that you have and the things that you put, I mean that in a very nice way, the, you know, the things that you've put together and the work that you've done is astounding. And um, I find myself thinking about the issue of, of a legacy. And when we think about minor and we think about the fact, correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that branch of the family tree is now gone, yes? There was minor, you know, there were parents and there was minor. And then in that way, things ended in that part of the white family and so on. And so, and yet, what, 42 years after his passing, there are nine, 10 of us sitting on this stage and a number of people and the numbers have changed throughout the day in this auditorium. And years upon years of thinking about Minor and looking at his work and caring about his photographs and caring about his handwritten notes, his postcards to his mother. Um, and I find that beyond, and the amount of work that people took just for the papers today, and we're not the only ones thinking about him. I find it so incredibly touching and profound uh, that Minor may not have had a legacy that those of us generally are used to through producing children and so on, but yet we are all here today thinking about him and talking about him and learning more and more about him so many years later.
and several members of the audience, uh, you know, uh, Sharon Wing and, and uh, Mr. Alera, it's, it's remarkable. There's and folks who learn the zone system in, in college or in, um, afterwards, it's quite remarkable all the, all the various people that he touched. When I think back to working over Cross Street at OHS, 1979, 1980, it, it really feels like almost yesterday. It's great to be able to come back to the work and, and find, find um, new appreciation for it and, and discover more material. There's so many different layers. Um, and of course, one of my, as a historian and an archivist, one of my interests has been sort of um, establishing dates, establishing locations. There's all sorts of really cool work that could be done with like um, geo-pinning photographs to down to the block level, to the half block level. You could do that with your GIS systems and image uh, mapping. And it's sort of amusing to me um, that in one of his earliest remarks from, from Memorable Fancies, he, he quoted himself from 1938, where he's making this point that his assignment, he had decided not to document the, the buildings, but to instead to try to render them in such a way that anyone looking at the images will re-experience something of the pride of 60 years ago the, those citizens must have felt. And then he, which is a great quotable quote, you know, and it sort of gets to that, you know, let me evoke an emotional response from very, very early. But then he immediately follows it up and he says, what does camera really know of time? Can it really distinguish between present subjective and past fu future objective? Or can I distinguish these matters? Um, so it's just, you know, he immediately turns it on its head of, of um, sort of saying maybe date and time doesn't really matter in this endeavor that I'm up to. So, which as an archivist and historian, I immediately think, no, 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 no. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, Brandon, sorry, Brandon said something kind of nice about how, um, he was this sort of among the photograph elite when that world was far smaller, but he's always a sort of dissonant or eccentric character within that, kind of this point of friction or resistance. Um, so I, I think one of the, the interesting things about sort of accidentally coming into his archive is that it's such a treat as a scholar. It's like there, it's like it's like a time release medication or something. He concentrated all of this, and he didn't have a family per se, but he. He was writing for the archive in a way that I think a lot of scholars and artists work for posterity or for future generations. So he's kind of a, a patron saint in, in that way. I was talking to another curator the other day who mentioned that she loves archives because there are things that she said didn't get a lot of shine when they came out, didn't necessarily have a, a public or a circulation, but then suddenly they might find a, a resonance 20 or 50 or 100 years later. So what I think is really exciting about something like today is that it seemed someone like Peter is such a, a, a strong writer and such a strong organizer of things that it seemed like the story might have been kind of done, but there's so much in the archive that I feel like we're kind of just scratching the surface. So I don't really know what comes next sort of logistically, but it seems like there's a, a momentum here. When I, I would just piggyback on that, Ian, to say that it, it's not just the archive, it's his, it includes his creative work as well. I mean, it includes things like, um, like Temptation, which you talked about, Todd. I mean, as I said to you during the lunch break, um, my best guess, because that was never shown publicly during White's lifetime, my best guess is that that has been seen by fewer than a few dozen people. Um, and that, that, that therein lies both a challenge and an invitation, because we the the whole of the archive memorable fancies certainly all of that um, requires a kind of deep dive but sitting and holding temptation of saint anthony and flipping through its 33 plates is a very different order of magnitude yeah i mean i i've thought a lot about the kind of fortunes of white <clears throat> And recently I was rereading um, A.D. Coleman's 1973 very punishing review of a white exhibition. And then white responds. And um, it's really difficult to read because it's, um, it's very angry um, <laughs> piece of writing. I mean, it calls him out for being a guru um, and a manipulator and an egotist and narcissist, et cetera, et cetera. 
And um, this was, it was widely circulated and it devastated, I think it devastated White, it devastated his reputation. Um, and it didn't recover for quite a while. I mean, Peter was a one man campaign, I think for some time. Um, I don't know when it kind of started up again, but I, um, I ha happened to um, be pretty close with uh, James Welling. And James Welling, when I mentioned Minor White, he got incredibly excited. He's like, Minor White, more Minor White. <laughs> um, which, is, which was not what I expected out of his mouth. Um, right. But his, his point was to say when, when he was in school, it was all Minor White all the time which is, I guess, the success and the problem, right? So in whatever that was, 73, 74, Minor White was everywhere, and then the, the decline was just as catastrophic, I guess, the popularity and then the decline. Um, so it's, it's, it's nice now to maybe get a little bit more even keel um, about the material and approach it with it, the, the guru aspect has faded away as a kind of issue. Um, we can th see it more historically, more situated, more contextual. Um, and sift through it in a new way um, after the legacy is kind of passed in a certain sense. So, you know, whatever, kind of rebirth after the family, certain family dies, I guess. That's my sense, at least. There's a, a nice thing about being able to see the guru aspect in history as well, right? For somebody who described him, I mean, lived a strange life and functioned as a kind of outsider in some ways, the fact that he was sort of an organizer of intentional communities and weird living situations and stuff like that makes him so thoroughly of his time rather than out of his time. Um, and it's nice to be able to get a kind of historical distance on that. Um, it's, it's the other end of the career, but I was thinking of a funny note that I had retraced getting ready to come here that didn't quite fit what I was speaking about today. Um, there's the major publication in 1969, Mirror Messages Manifestations, which is the you know, the sort of close, like one of the big total statements that does come out during his lifetime. Um, and the original versions of it, hopefully some of you still have these at home. Um, the book is published with a sort of l little brochure in the back of all of these laudatory, I mean, sort of like blurbs almost, but tucked into this book within a book. Um, and somewhere in the archive, you've got Minor Shapiro's original, sorry, Meyer Shapiro's original notes to self for this text he's gonna write for that blurb. Um, which are candid and quite critical in a lot of ways, especially for somebody who was there at a sort of root moment. Um, and one of the things he mentions, thinking about what we can see on view upstairs, um, he's got this comment early on, right, that White always poses himself and carries himself like a loner, but showed this obvious deep acquaintance from day one with every possible photographic fashion of the 1930s. Um, and I think Shapiro actually says, sometimes to the detriment of his own taste, right? The sort of l loner figure who was completely immersed in everything despite the pose. Um, yeah, and I mean, a sort of, of the 30s in the 30s and of the 60s in the 60s, there are some strange qualities in both directions. Actually, that, um, one oh, other thought there. Yes, please. Sorry, at the other end. Um, there's also... Somewhere in the diaries, early, mid-1960s, a series of entries where I think he's recording conversations with somebody who is either a therapist or a Gurdjieff initiate, and I'm not sure which. I think it might be somebody on the Gurdjieff side. Um, and she basically calls him out and asks him point blank as he records the story later on, right, are you using photography as a tool of spiritual growth? or are you using spiritual growth as a branding strategy in photography? You can't have it both ways, buddy, right? And I, and I think she adds, and the, lo the higher should not serve the lower, right? The person he's talking to has a very clear sense of how that should go. He's a little less sure, right? He's still making up his mind in a lot of ways. There's a question in the back. That doesn't sound like the name I'm thinking of, but I know I've seen that name somewhere. March, maybe? March, yes. yes. It's Mrs. March. Looks like we're onto something here. Can we just, can we just, but can we just have a moment where we say, that, like, you just told this anecdote and gave, like, a bare sketch, and two people in the audience were, were, gave up names immediately. <laughs> I, I bow down to both of you. 
This is why we have mobile microphones. They can go that way. Experts everywhere. It's great. Um, answer to your question. I think the when minor white started to become less in the photography world was it was Cibrochrome was really the catalyst for the conversion from when we went from the Zone 6 workshops into Cibrochrome printing because we no longer had control of the negative. The negative was printed at a lab. So that changed everything at that point. When we started, the only change we did is we took Cibrochrome and we made pinhole cameras. That gave us control. But up and uh, after that, really things changed a lot. Um, I think that's when now you're seeing a resurgence in back into black and white photography, and so you have control over that process. Color is very rudimentary. I mean, you give the negative to the lab, you print it, it comes back. You print Cibrochrome, it prints. There's very little dodging and, and manipulation per se in the process. So that's probably when that changed a little bit. So good to see it come back. It's a thought fit for P.H. Emerson. But, but I'm going to pose a question here to some people who've spent more time digging than I have because, of course, Miner works in color. Um, he, I have, there's an entire slide cabinet filled with color slides. And Catherine can probably help me here, but they go back to certainly the 50s. Um, and so it's not like he's, it's not like color is an interruptive or decisive break towards the end of his career. And one of the questions that, that I've often wondered about is the role that these color slides play. Because to your point exactly, surely those were, those were processed, right? They were processed, they were, there was the loss of control you're talking about, and yet here there are drawers and drawers and drawers and drawers of them, um, each with their own numbering system, again. So it's, it, to me, it suggests something beyond a mere pedagogical tool. Um, but it's not, like, it's not like it comes at a moment when everything else shifts. It feels more continuous. But that's an impression I have, and I wonder if others. Did, does Princeton have any of his complete slideshows to a projector slideshows? Yes. <laughs> Probably, yes. They've got Probably. all the slides to slow one. dance. Yeah. Um, and I was going to ask in a moment if anybody here had seen that in one of the projections. Uh, wonderful. I'd love to hear more in a moment. Um, I know they've got all of slow dance. I don't recall if they have others. Yeah. Also, um, there's the two photographs lecture. It's, it's clear from reading the transcript that it was an illustrated slide lecture on his interacting with the masters and then using his his old photographs and his new photographs and where in brackets it says click hold slide for you know two minutes and talk etc which would be fantastic to find that carousel if it still exists and sort of recreate it if it was recorded so and i think this is where the recreation and where the archival research can lead to some of this because my mike yeah my experience with it was he would do these fade and dissolve slideshows, which were absolutely hypnotic. And um, yeah, yeah, I've never seen anything like it. And there were, it wasn't with music or anything, it was just, and he was so good with, with how he would, he was able to, to work the graphic sequence in such a way that um, one image moving into another just seemed like so natural. Um, do you have anything like that? I mean, was anything like that ever programmed and, and uh, recorded? <laughs> we were just talking about <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> recordings at lunch. Um, there are many. And, and we, we are at the point of trying to figure out how to convert them and to understand what they're on and to either uh, even play them at all. So well, he, had, he traveled with two Leica projectors. And they, they, he, had, he had dimmers. Huh. And he'd play, he'd play with both hands with the dimmers. And 
It was it was unbelievable. <laughs> to my knowledge, I don't have control of projectors. <laughs> I don't. Think I may I have do. the entire library, <laughs> right. ten feet from my office, but I I have not seen the projectors, and I can't I can't recall multiple instances of carousels either. Huh. He Matt. always had a Leica, and I and that's that's what he would he would shoot. Those things, you know, you almost never saw him without a Leica. But Ken's going to help my memory here. I was just going to suggest Matt Cowan <laughs> would probably have a good sense of how to take the old tapes and yes. um, play them back right and get a good capture. Yes. That's very easy to do, at least how it's described to me. And also, I will say, where I used to work, just a plug for anthology film archives in the East Village, uh, we used to do, and I think still believe do, analog, recreations of analog slide performances, whether it's Carly Schneeman or Ken Jacobs or Paul Sheritz are doing these installations, and it sounds like maybe we need to get a little money and do a, uh, a slide, a recreation, because it's a difference finding a film or a video that was taken of it would be a documentation of the performance, not the performance yeah. itself, so that would be very interesting too. I don't know how easy that is, clearly it's not that easy. But. Just to add a little bit to that, from 1970 to 1976, Minor uh, did show those slideshows and dissolve slideshows. And he also, uh, by 74, 75, put music to some, and it was called Creative Audience. So if you were a student, you were there and asked to respond creatively to how the show was shown. And there was a multitude of color material, and he was photographing in color, as you said, simultaneously, almost from the beginning when a uh, roll film was available. I'm not sure if there was a sheet film. I think in 47 or 48, um, Weston began with some Kodachrome that was sent to him and, and others who were prominent people. But to speak to about the legacy, I, this is an amazing conference today, by the way. I really uh, thank you all for enlightening us um, but there is a great legacy of many people who are teaching or ending their teaching careers now who were trained through uh, the creative photo lab at MIT. Um, and at that time, I don't know if the demise was really um, that Minor fell out of favor or there were just more voices. And, and of course, he's a founding member of the SPE. So as we progress now to 2018, with Aperture and SPE, he, his concerns for photography were always paramount as well to the teaching and in influencing people. I just want to say that, Aspen, when you, when you spoke about the aerial photograph and kind of zooming out and being able to look down and have a singular eye, um, for those of you who are familiar with Gurdjieff mythology, uh, the, what you were trying to attain was a singular I, meaning the one that goes to sleep, is the same ego that wakes up in the morning. And that, in his later life, was uh, a big goal. So that was a really apropos way to describe that, because I think he would have appreciated it. I guess I was lucky. Cool. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sir, where did you see these uh, slides? Was that here in Oregon, or did you see them elsewhere? Right here. Right here in Oregon. It's probably right there. <laughs> At the museum. So well, did it was in the, in the old art school. The right, the old art school. The one that he wanted Robert Tyler Davis to build, and Robert Tyler Davis in 46 said, oh, we don't have the money, and so, and so we lost Minor, and he went down to San Francisco, never to return full time again. So. Yeah, amazing. Thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, one more comment that I have on my list, um, and I was talking about this with uh, some of the, the group this morning. I took them upstairs because they, uh, some had already seen the show, some had not because they just arrived yesterday. Um, and. I had not been able to, because of my own schedule, I hadn't really accessed the original prints for a number of years. A lot of the work that we do, because we have the capability, is, um, you know, I have my database online, and all of these images have been um, 
very well documented and uh, high resolution imagery and so on. So I can access them uh, remotely, quote unquote, from my desk. But when I went to work on this exhibition and decide which photographs to put in the exhibition, it was quite overwhelming to go back to the boxes after a number of years and open the boxes and think more closely and critically about where Minor was in his career, and someone else had mentioned this during their talk, the how accomplished he was so quickly and how both through the images he made and the technique that he used and the prints that he created, the stunning work that he did very early on. And it makes me so happy really to be a curator because uh, for me, the thing itself is so critically important, that piece of paper. I love the fact that we have an internet and that we can um, eventually hopefully stitch all of our archives together. So if you are living in the Czech Republic, if you are living wherever, you can access this information if you have questions or thought, uh, thoughts about minor. But um, where I hope that museums don't go away or archives don't ever go away, it is a different moment to stand in front of the thing itself and to experience that object um, and sometimes I forget about that because I do love the ways in which we use uh, the photographic image in so many new ways since the advent of digital technology. I think it's absolutely wonderful. Um, but that doesn't mean it doesn't have to exist in a particular time and in a particular place. And I think that his prints that we have on view now are a wonderful manifestation uh, of that, um, of that work that can be done with the camera and through the print and with the one-on-one -on -one experience of that object within a, a particular place at a certain time. That is absolutely true. I mean, nothing could have made that clear for me than the moment when we came across a box of 900 some, 950 or so uh, contact prints. Uh, dating largely to the late 1930s and early 1940s, continuing into the, I think the last ones are sort of right around 1950, um, but a huge bulk of which are endless contact prints of the photographic sessions with Tom Murphy that will become Temptation of St. Anthony as Mirrors. And I mean, holding stacks of contact prints of any one of the images that Todd, you showed, and seeing him work through how, like that one where, his, uh, where Tom Murphy's body is entwined with the piece of wood, um, seeing Minor White work through um, how dark the background will be, how bright the wood will be, how hidden Tom Murphy's sex will or will not be, is so important and there's there's it's very hard to get that experience if you don't have the opportunity to take those contact prints and literally line them up next to the bound version of Temptation of St. Anthony and see where where if that print in Temptation of St. Anthony is the period to the sentence this is all the words that get you there To sort of follow on a, a comment you made earlier, Kate, too, about the variety of prints that are the, the same photograph in a variety of prints, and which one do you go back to? Um, and then just being able to experience the physical presence, be in the physical presence of the print. It's interesting to me that, that the, the photographs from this period, from the WPA period, he was, he was printing on warm tone paper, fiber base, the light kind of refracted off it. It gives you a completely different experience from when he went back to them and he printed on cold tone paper. Um, and it's, it's, uh, it's a different emotional experience. And some of it, I'm sure the photographers will be able to sort of date how, how hard it was to get good fiber based paper, say, and the, well, in the late 60s, I think you could still do that if you wanted to go down that road and you could, you could tone it and everything else. So, that's just kind of an uh, interesting thing that you can sort of experience best when you're sitting right in front of the, front of the prints. Uh, 
I'd also like to say thank you. What an amazing day. I've learned so much. And wanted to just uh, make a comment and kind of a hope. Um, I live mentally mostly in the late 19th and early 20th century in my thinking. So I intersect Minor in his early days. And I'm listening to you today talking about his influences, um, and particularly his time here with the Oregon Camera Club and the photographers he might have seen. I mean, I, I hear you talk about Weston. I hear you talk about Adams. But he's also intersecting with probably Myra Wiggins and Lily White, and um, someone particularly mentioned Henry Berger, who was a pictorialist photographer of Portland's architecture. So my hope would be that in looking back at his early days, people are also thinking about those photographers he was intersecting with here who were bringing that to his work. Um, and I know it's, uh, it's heresy to mention pictorialism with a photographer after 1940, but I do wonder about pictorialist influences on his work, and particularly his desire to evoke um, emotions and experiences in his work. So would love to kind of uh, either hear comments on that or just hope that in the future people also look back at that in his work. And thank you again for today. I think some of it goes to the sources because uh, my, my sort of, um, one of my drives is to get to the original source. So when I learned that there was a, a journal on a, in a thing called Memorable Fancies and then went to the archive to look at it because it's another thing that's not, not published, although he abstracted it into mirrors and messages, um, the original of it is, is not there. And, and some of this, um, I'm, I'm just sort of drawing a blank in terms of whether there's primary contemporaneous material that shows the interaction he had here in Portland, apart from what he says in Memorable Fancies where he says, I was really mostly interested in the pictorialists and camera craft and you know, uh, the group F64. Um, and in discussing this with Peter, and if you look in, in Peter's catalog, he says pretty much at this period that he, he kind of felt that the pictorial influence was a bit more um, um, important at that point in his career. Maybe not so much as kind of thinking of pictorialism as soft focus and trying to be painterly, et cetera, but um, in, in this other sort of definition in terms of forms and shapes and the, uh, the subject being less important than the photograph, which you could do at F64 still. Yeah, I, um, I think he'd agree with you wholeheartedly. And that was a label he was comfortable using even in relation to his own work, at least into the early 1950s. Um, at one point in that series of articles I was talking about earlier, um, he shows his soft focus work in that early infrared picture. And then he shows some more you know, experimental, if you'll call it that, negative prints and solarizations and stuff like that. Um, and in so many words, says this is the modern approach to pictorialism, but it's still the same game. right? Um, and it's interesting for him, right? the stuff that's coming out of the Institute of Design at the same time, or will be a few years later. I mean, that Bauhaus in America kind of stuff, it's still, to him, kind of pictorial. It's a right, term he's comfortable using and a bucket he's still half comfortable putting himself into somehow. He always points to, um, um, he would often point to the, the, the book that you had on the right side of the screen, The America and Alfred Stieglitz, and um, Waldo Frank edited it, Lewis Mumford, lots of, um, it's a good read to sort of get into that world, that mindset of what he was thinking about and what he, he felt to be important. And I think at that point, probably before he got into the stage theory, it was probably um, Stieglitz and equivalents that he really sort of latched on to early on. But that's just kind of a random thought. I was curious about um, this. You you used the the one print and correctly noted that it was solarized, and then you played with like negative prints later on, and then there's another example of solarization in his Portland work, the shot of the of the um, bus terminal. Is it, will that be shown? Yeah, I plan on, yeah, we do have a print. It's, it's bizarre. It's only partially solarized and it's, um, it's, it's confusing, but f I really like it. Yeah, so the, I do plan to show that. Okay. Do we have any other thoughts or comments either from the stage or from the audience today? Um, 
if anybody wants to come out for a tour of the 100,000 square foot warehouse in Gresham for the Oregon Historical Society, just send me an email and we can make it happen. There's all kinds of fun stuff to look at and play with out there. That is very tempting. <laughs> with what, six million photographs you told me at lunch? I, uh, in their collection, yeah, might never see us again. But uh, that's really fantastic. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for being here today, either through YouTube or uh, in person. I am so grateful to everyone on stage here today uh, who made uh, some very long treks to be here to think about these ideas around Minor White and his continued importance to us. As I mentioned, the exhibition will have a refresh in uh, early May, so from about the 7th to the 11th, the gallery will be closed, and approximately the 12th, it will open up again with a whole new series of uh, early minor white photographs, so we welcome you back then. And the museum is open tonight until 8 p.m., so if you haven't had a chance to go upstairs yet, please take the opportunity, if you have the time, and enjoy uh, the rest of the museum as well. And again, thank you so much for being here with us today. <laughs>